Hey guys, welcome back to Real Housewives Recaps. I'm so glad you're here. You guys, the reactions when I put out these best of compilations have blown me away. They truly have. I I can't believe how long you guys are watching these and really get into them and then comment that they're some of your favorite videos. I just can't tell you how much that means. Having put all the hours of work into these, I just it means so much to me. It truly does. So thank you for watching these. This one I'm excited about. This one is best of, say it with me, revenge. Whether you read the Tom Bauer book or you watch my recaps on it, or you're just here, you know, for the first time, not having read it and wanted to see some highlights, you've come to the right place. It is so interesting rewatching these videos that I did a while ago and going back through, I mean, the awful behavior out of Harry and Megan. This is, is specifically some of my favorite part. I mean, <laughs> favorite's not the right word. Uh, some of the most interesting parts of their awfulness while with the royal family. So I'm excited to dive into this. You have over three hours worth of content here, and I truly hope you enjoy it so much. Now, these are just parts of the book that I'm discussing uh, out of, again, the Tom Bauer book, Revenge. So if it seems a little disjointed, it's because I may have cut out like a more boring section to bring you the more interesting stuff, hence the compilation of it all. So I've just cut these videos to to try to make it make sense, but there are parts where it kind of jumps in time a little bit. That's what's going on there. The other thing I want to say is I recorded these a long time ago. Yes, we've learned more information along the way. So you might hear me say something that's, I don't know, outdated and we've learned more sense, or you might even hear me call Catherine, Princess of Wales, Kate or Duchess of Cambridge. That's because when I recorded these, that was her title. So just know that, again, the, they might date themselves a little bit in the way I refer to people, but the sentiment stays the same. It's more the interesting stories that Tom Bauer t tells about them that I'm excited to get into. So without further ado, let's take a look. Thanks so much for being here, everybody. Honk, honk. Hey guys, welcome back to Real Housewives Recaps. Today, we're talking revenge. I'm continuing on my discussion of the book Revenge by Tom Bauer. Future Jen here, I had to interrupt myself and tell you, you picked a great episode. This is one of my favorite things I've ever recorded. It gets very heated. I get very feisty. I even get Jay on the mic in a little bit. Um, so stay tuned for this one. Watch all the way through and buckle up because there's some real good Megan juice in this one. So in case you missed it, I did put out my first episode where I kind of gave the backstory, Megan's growing up, all that good stuff. This time we're getting into some juice. Boy, do we have some juice in this part of the book. We're going to be getting into some of the diva behavior that started to show up. Megan came out of control. So this is some really good stuff. Some, some of my favorite parts of the book coming up. I'm excited to talk about it with you guys. Thanks so much for being here. After 26, expect Exposure. So remember we left off, it was about February 2019, People Magazine had come out and Megan decided she needed to fight back the media. People are being mean to her. So what does she do? She goes to the media. <laughs> <laughs> right? You can't make this stuff up. So they go to the media to fight back against people fighting her in the media. I'm saying it like that because I'm trying to make it make sense and I can't. Hey, make it make sense. Check out my merch. I make it make sense merch. I promise I didn't do that on purpose. I just find myself saying that all the time when discussing Harold and Fraud, Hank and Skank. So uh, check out the merch. Make it make sense. Okay. But yeah, so she's trying to fight back the media by using the media again. Hello, Spare. Same thing. Fight back against every grievance ever written in crayon and and using the media to do it. But then accusing the media of being mean to her. Hmm. Sure. She also wanted to spend everything as all Thomas's fault. She decided that she would share excerpts of the letter that she had written Thomas that clearly was meant to be shared to the world. She can deny it all she wants, but we all can see through that. She wanted to paint herself as a loving daughter who is seeking reconciliation. Well, we discussed this in the last episode that that's clearly not what she was trying to do. Again, you just can't go by anything that Harold and Fraud say. Everything's a lie. They live in their own little world. So this article, she thought, ooh, I'll speak back against the media, but I'll do it through my friends. And I'm using, again, Joey's air quotes on that one because 
it's Megan, right? It's Megan through all of it. It's Megan through speaking through here. It's Megan speaking through Spare. But she decided to put up parts of the letter to her dad. Uh, she basically shared it with her friends and then had them recite parts of it in this People magazine article. Now, here's the fun part. This is the part that I find juicy. It's because of this, because of her not playing by the rules. And what I mean there is the palace, there's a lot of talk in this part of the book about the palace staff was there to help her, including they have, of course, a press office, a press department, whatever you want to call it, that was there and ready to help. But she... (laughs) She has to do her own thing. She only wants to use the palace when it's convenient for her. Where have we heard this before? It's the same thing she does with people. She'll use them. She'll decide she doesn't need them anymore and then cut them out. So that seems to be what she did with the palace press that were there trying to help. Of course, Megan claims she got no help. That's a whole other story. But because of this, this is the part that I love. She thought, I'm clever. I'm, I'm going to do what I want because she's Cartman. Um, she decided to use this publication to filter out parts of her letter to her dad. And because of that, it ended up becoming public domain. And that's the leg that they had to stand on with her dad's side, which we'll get to. But I'm just saying, go with me here on the big picture. This is the reason that Thomas was able then to go to the media and share the letter because Megan started it first, but Megan will never see it like that, right? Megan is always a victim. Everybody else is wrong. She is free to speak up to the press whenever she feels like it, but condemns people like her dad who are trying to speak up to the press, not first, but almost as a a rebuttal, a way to clear his own name. So just think about that because, again, it's that's the kind of stuff that keeps me riveted, you guys. I just, there's no logic there. It's all narcissism. It's all their own truth. I'm sitting here just shaking my head. I wish you, could, I wish you were here with me. Like, we <laughs> crack open one and <laughs> have a conversation about why I am riveted by this stuff, but I truly am. It's fascinating. It's like serial killer stuff, right? It's wild. Okay, so... Again, she put out, she shared this letter with her friends who gave this interview. And so parts of the letter were recited back in this interview. Clearly, Megan had a hand in it. She can deny it all she wants. These friends, I'm laughing because these friends tried to rebut all negative things said about Megan. But, you know, like that would take however many millennia to do. (laughs) So they tried to rebut things like the staff bullying claims. You know how they did this? They used evidence of Megan providing ice cream for her staff as her being a great boss. And I'm just laughing because I believe Harry did the same thing when he was talking about Megan. He brought up that she brought she bought her staff ice cream, you guys, so she can't be a monster. Right? I mean, think about all the stories we've heard. I don't want to go too dark, but just think about all the stories we've heard of horrible partners doing horrible things to the other one and then oh you buy flowers afterwards right I mean it's just it's that (laughs) so here's some ice cream oh also in the retelling of this buying ice cream it's not like hey you know we got the staff a nice ice cream treat an ice cream truck I think came something like that no according to Megan's camp the staff cheered and said it was the best day that's a very sad description right I doubt that that (laughs) I doubt that they they did that. I just, it just doesn't make sense. Make it make sense. She's saying that the, the demands claims were being sensationalized. And so they were trying to combat that. She also tried to start, this is when she started boosting her self-importance and again, love Tom Bauer. He succinctly says by doing that, she's not even afraid to put down Harry and talked about how she was there to help him write his speeches because, you know, he'd never done that before her. Although after reading Spare, I bet that guy needs all the help he can get. You can barely read his crayon writing in his coloring books, right? (laughs) I can only imagine. So the letter we've discussed at length in other episodes, you can go watch those, but it's the very contrived, controlled handwriting and everything else. It's the way it's meant to tug at the heartstrings, all that. Well, in the People magazine article, it spun as an attempt to reconcile with dad. Well, we know the truth. She tried to say that he hadn't 
been trying to get in touch with her that he still knew her phone number and never bothered to call. She implied that he was lying over his health concerns and the possible surgery that he had, that sort of thing, even though he openly discussed the surgery he was going in. He even talks about the hospital he was at. Um, interesting how, again, everybody else is lying except for Harold and Fraud, Hank and Skank. So she also claims that she looked out for everyone financially. Again, this continues to come up. It's her favorite thing to claim. Tom Bauer is saying that this whole thing, all these rebuttal points, of course, came from Megan. We know this. She's pretending like it's through these five friends, but it's from Megan. Hello. No one could understand Megan's plan. The palace was upset by her taking this on, not involving them. And it just, she's her own worst enemy, right? And it is funny. Just, I just think about, you know, they always talk about Megan's invasion of privacy. I guess both of their invasion of privacy, but the only one invading privacy is themselves. They tell every detail of everything, right? So we wouldn't know all this stuff if those two, you know, asshats would stop speaking up. So as we've also heard before, once again, Knopf gets a call, uh, gets lots of calls from the media, and he just answers back, no comment, no comment. Well, Megan is very pissed about this. She thinks he should be, I don't know, she just likes to control everything. So it's like he should be giving all the answers that she has written out for him to give. She thinks he works for her directly, and that's not his job. He works on behalf of the palace, the royal family in general, not Meghan Markle. So, of course, Meghan doesn't understand that. So she thinks he should be giving these canned answers that she's written for him. So she's getting increasingly pissed. So, again, fun place to work, right? Sounds great. Thomas is feeling so misrepresented misrepresented by all this and says that the tone of the letter that they present in the People Magazine article is not the tone of the letter that he received. And that it's the same thing we all say. Like, they, everything's a spin with these two. Nothing's real. They spin it their way and that's that. Everybody else is wrong. So he decides he just has to publish it. So he fought back. He showed the letter to the mail on Sunday, and that's where that lawsuit ends up coming from. Harry and Meghan sued the mail on Sunday. It was actually their parent company, but um, for publishing the letter, even though clearly Meghan intended for it to get out. But guys, how else will they look like the victims? How else, right? They've always got to find a way. Nothing's ever their fault. Thomas fought. So when Thomas showed this letter, the argument was, is that... Thomas was entitled to dispute the stories. So that's the part that I just, I like to think about a lot is they use the press. I don't, I'm not trying to make sense out of it because you can't, but I'm just saying it's just so fascinating to me. These two hate the press. If you don't believe me, listen to every other word that they that comes out of their mouth, right? They, they claim to hate the press, right? But they use the press. Except for when the press says one wrong thing about them, then the press goes back to evil. They're allowed to use the press to say or do whatever they want. Spare, right? <laughs> uh, People Magazine, right? And if anybody dare do the same to them, well, then that person's just evil or prejudice of some sort. You can imagine what ist I'm going with, right? Like, that just is, the, that's their only argument. It's It just blows my mind. No intelligent person can follow that that train of thought. It just, it doesn't make it make sense. You can't, <laughs> you can't. So Megan clearly intended on that letter being leaked from the contrived handwriting, like we discussed to the pulling at the heartstrings with the wording, every we've discussed it. Megan is spinning though as, oh, I can't believe the mail on Sunday leaked my letter. It's just continued campaign to publish false and derogatory stories about her and then what does she do? Calls it one of the is that she loves to say, right? Her favorite word because she can't think of anything else to call them. So she has to go into race stuff where nobody else is going, but it's her favorite thing to do. It was also during this time that she persuaded George Clooney to get out and speak on her behalf. So she doesn't want to, I'm sorry, you got to find it funny. She doesn't want to use these trained 
palace officials whose job it is to get out there and speak on behalf of the royal, you know, among other jobs, but you know what I'm saying. But yet she wants to use George Clooney because she seems to, she must be getting dumber because of Harry. I don't know. Like, it's, that seems like a teenager mentality. I'm going to get the famous guy to speak up for me and everybody will be persuaded. So she gets George Clooney to give some statement where the media is blasted and he ends up comparing Megan to Diana. Well, at the mention of Megan and Diana in the same sentence, you know, Harry's off in the corner with his Elizabeth Arden cream. Ew. Okay, so... Tom Bauer points out there was no intrusion by the press into her private life, especially at this time. She was pregnant with Archie, and he even points out there was not a single unapproved picture of Megan while she was pregnant. Megan's biggest invasion of privacy was herself. So Megan argued that she had the right to speak, but, you know, clearly it's just for her nobody else is allowed to speak because she blows a gasket if her father's dare if her father dares do the same megan convinced harry to abandon the royal press offices altogether and to use press out of california hmm yeah don't know why we think they've all set this is all a plan that they've set up right they want to have their own social media presence we'll get to that because it's coming don't worry all right, so then we get into chapter 27, baby shower. She is, I think they said about eight months pregnant at this time. She decided that because she had so few friends in London, imagine that, that she decided to go to America to hang out with her acquaintances <laughs> over there. So she wants to go over and plot her destiny. Amazing, and I'm going to say Tom Bauer points this out, so don't come for me. I don't care. Tom Bauer points this out so beautifully. He says, amazing how her depression seems to have cleared during this time because we don't have further mention of that stuff that we were talking about in the last episode. Megan asked her good friend, and by that I mean acquaintance, Serena Williams, publicist, to arrange her baby shower for her. The gall on this woman. Can you imagine? Who doesn't have good enough friends that will just handle it for you? And I'm sorry, but when you get into that much money and privilege, do you need a baby shower? You need your friends buying you stuff? Ask for donations to go to charity. Whatever. Like, it's just ridiculous. Over the top ridiculous. I don't even begrudge her going to see her friends, but we're going to get into what this was. This was more of a publicity stunt for all involved. So she asked them to throw this party. They agreed. And it was a launch pad for a group of friends to exploit her status. That was Tom Bauer's words, not mine. And I say that because I think, did she have status? I guess at that point, maybe. Okay, so we had people like Gail King, Amal Clooney, that Misha, Misha, sorry, Nanu, and Jessica Mulroney. So Megan decided to use this time to list her grievances. Sure, happy occasion. Why let the baby take center stage, right? You should be listing your grievances. Sounds like a really fun baby shower. And she loved the extravagance. She was determined to get her money's worth. She, they all decided, it's so funny to look at pictures you know, if you really wanted to have an intimate baby shower, fine. That's not what this was. They made a point of having their cars pull around front and having press. The press that they pretend to hate, they had a special area for the press to stand and take pictures as they each make their grand entrance. Of course they did. Ah. <laughs> oh, God. Oh. I'm so glad you guys are here and get me because I feel it. I feel your frustration too. It's fun. Okay, so the following day, a lot of this group each went out and did their own interviews about the baby shower. Again, sounds like fun, huh? All publicity. It sounds like an Instagram baby shower, right? Something you just do for the gram? I don't know. I'm a thousand. I don't know. <laughs> but it just, it's all for show. None of it's real. It's These aren't like your good friends that you went to high school, college, whatever with and grew up with. These are celebrities who are making money off of each other. So two days after returning to London, after this big baby shower, she 
and Harry flew to Morocco. Things are tough, guys. She had to go from, you know, to America and then to Morocco. Don't you feel sorry for them? They'll try to get you feel sorry for them. <laughs> she claims that they needed extra protection by using a private jet. And listen, let me put, let me be clear about this because I don't know if I've cleared this up. I don't care who uses private jets. Hell, great. Have fun. That's not what bothers me. What bothers me is we're about to get to it, but they started giving these speeches about how important it is for global warming and all, you know, I don't get political here, but you know where I'm going with this. Like lots of pandering stuff about climate and stuff like that while flying around in their private jets. Interesting, right? I would like to remind you too that when she was had the TIG, she made a post about the importance of protecting the earth. Meanwhile, Harry and Meghan had flown like, I think it was like seven times in eight weeks back and forth to see each other. So yeah, how's that uh, protecting the earth going? Again, the rules don't apply to them. Just like everybody else in Holly Weird, right? So the New York trip had sealed her fate. Obviously, she started getting the ball rolling. Then she got in touch with Vogue and decided that she was going to promote her charity, a charity that she had just joined a few months before. And the editor of Vogue came over to her place. Uh, I guess, I think they said not caught. I don't know where they're living. Who cared? No, it was, they were at Frogmore this time. So the editor of Vogue came out to meet with her and to visit with her. And this is where it gets interesting because Tom even points out they have differing accounts of how this went down. So I would like to be a fly on the wall. I feel like Maggie Poo tried to exert too much control and the Vogue guy was not having it. And <laughs> I just wonder how that all went. But he came to her place and Megan, according to Megan, which I don't believe anything she says, but her side of the story is that she pitched an idea to guest edit an issue. The editor, his name escapes me, but I'll flash him on the screen, said that it was his idea. I don't care. Somebody had the idea that she should work on the September issue. Megan decided, yeah, I'm going to do this, but I'm not going to tell the palace about it. Why Why would I respect anybody? Why would I abide by years and years of traditions and everything else and be respectful and let them know, hey, I got a piece I'm working on. And yet again, she flashed forward. Her thing was nobody was there to help her, but it sure sounds like she wasn't doing anything to help them while she was there. Why would she, right? Why would she? Okay, let's get into the next chapter. Chapter 28, wellness. So Harry, at this point, I love this quote so much, I wrote it down. Harry became an empty royal cipher. <laughs> what do I mean? Well, Megan was filling him up with her ideas. Harry's so dumb, he didn't even stop to question anything. He was just like, uh, okay, Meg. I just turned him into Al Bundy. Okay, Meg. So Harry started to speak his pseudo profundo jabber. Harry started giving climate change speeches and taking helicopters and private jets to go give them. You guys, that kills me. Every time I hear of a celebrity doing that, it's just no self-awareness whatsoever. He started to have unpredictable, contrarian behavior at everything. So again, this is... His, I mean, his whole attitude just changing. Everybody sees it. They go into stories of how he was meant to go to these different events and try to, you know, schmooze with donors and stuff like that. But instead, he decided to make it his own little soapbox and throw childlike temper tantrums. Again, I refer you to Spare. That's pretty much, that's the book review I would give it. <laughs> it's a childlike temper tantrum. Also during this time, they lost another member of staff. Amy Piccarella had stuck in there for one year. That lady deserves an award because that's a lot. But guys, I don't know why she left. She obviously had an amazing ice cream social. She cheered and said it was the best day ever if you ask Hank and Skank about it. She should have been able to ignore all the tea throwing and tantrums. She should have just uh, enjoyed the ice cream socials. But... The queen was still trying to keep the peace, love the queen, and she sent in Lord Gite to try to help embed Meghan into the royal family, help her stop being such a mess. This is about the time frame where we really see the antagonism 
of the Sussexes, they, they just can't stand the palace anymore. It's good enough for them when they need things from it, but it's not good when they don't get exactly what they want. Megan is wanting to re-engage people online. She wants to, I don't know, start back up the TIG. She, who knows? But she wanted to do this. So this is where Sussex Royal sprouted up. So she wanted to be able to answer people immediately and to be able to use it to get attention. So then we go to early March 2019. This is where she denied reading any social media about herself. Do you remember that interview she gave where she's like, no, no, I don't do that. It was very condescending the way that she spoke. Like, no, I would not do that. No, I would not read social media. <laughs> don't look at you it. You never look at, say, Twitter. No. I'm sorry, no. <laughs> um, you know, and I, for me, that is my personal preference, right? But I do read The Economist, um, <laughs> so I'll give you that one, too. Um, yes. Oh, please, Rich. You are on social media more than the rest of us combined. Come on. So she's planning a secret move to California. This is about the time that they believe that that is starting to happen. Oh, also at that meeting, that's where she announced that the baby in her belly, whether it's a boy or a girl, was already a feminist. Take that how you will. So it was about this time, again, where they believed that the secret planning to move to California was happening. And Oprah interview, they were starting to plan that. And Oprah wanted to sweeten the deal to get these two talking to her. And I'm thinking, she probably didn't have to do shit to sweeten that deal. You know, especially Megan was chomp well, both of them chomping at the bits to try to get the attention any way that they can. And of course, to talk to Oprah. Why else would they invite a complete stranger, Oprah, to their wedding, right? Why else? And again, I point you to present day where Oprah didn't feel the need to invite them to her birthday party. It's hilarious. So Oprah tries to sweeten the deal by saying, listen, if you'll do this interview with me, I will produce a show with Harry about mental health. I remember hearing about that. It was supposed to be an episodic show um, about mental health, mental health awareness. Again, it's interesting that he's talking about that, but yet, as Bauer points out, he was not there for his wife very much in terms of getting her help when she was struggling with mental health. They can only blame the palace, but they don't take anything on themselves to try to, you know, take action to help themselves. Then we see more of this. Oh, any critic that rejects their truth, I'm using the quotation marks again, they are prejudiced. We've heard this before. The press office got Sarah Lantham in. She is brand new. She, well, She's had a long history of working with the press, but she's new to the position. She came in, and on the 14th of March, there was an announcement made that the era of the Fab Four was over. We knew behind the scenes it had fallen apart, but that was the official announcement that the Fab Four were done. I am so impressed by William and Catherine for lasting even that long. That's They had showed so much restraint during then. I just, yeah, that's a long time. So at Su Sussex Royal, I just always want to say sucks in there because those two Sussexes suck. So I, my apologies to anybody that lives in Sussex. I've talked to a couple of you who say it's lovely and that you enjoy it and that you hate that those uh, are tied in any way to Sussex. <laughs> that sucks. But Sussex Royal was born and and it launched on Instagram. Bauer goes into the stats. They had about a million followers in the first six hours, and they had five million a year later. And Tom Bauer's a petty bitch, just like I am. And I love him for that because he points out that the Cambridges had 7.4 million followers. <laughs> I normally wouldn't chuckle at something like that because who cares, but I find it very funny. They announced, oh, okay, so they took to the new Sussex Royal handle to announce Harry's new project a dynamic multi-part project on mental health working with oprah so they locked that in there thus sealing their fate they i mean we already do this but sealing the fate that they would absolutely be giving that oprah interview and cutting ties with the royal family essentially so but they sure did not want to cut ties with those titles we're talking revenge Ooh, i kind of added into the we're talking let me try that again we're talking revenge. Oh my gosh. Are we ever. I am so excited for this episode. Let me just tell you a little behind the scenes magic. 
Normally, I listen to a couple chapters and try to break them down for you. No, 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 no. I'm only listening to about 20 minutes and I just had to jump on mic and talk about how insane things have gotten with Hank and Skank. (laughs) Especially Skank. Let me tell you what's going on. Okay, first of all, welcome. I'm so glad you're here. I am thrilled to be diving into this part. Revenge, let me just dive in. I'm so excited. I'm caffeinated. I'm thrilled. I just can't wait to talk about this. So I started it up and I started taking my little notes and my jaw just dropped. I've read this book before, but it's been a long time and I've read about a million books since. So I did not remember all these details of this part of the book. We are going to get into the birth of Archie. Now, I always get a million comments. Yes, I'm very full, fully aware of the moon bump and the the different stories going on around this birth. I'm just going to cover this book and what Tom Bauer is alleging and what's being told here. Think what you will on that stuff. I have my own opinions. We'll talk about that maybe in another video. This isn't the place for it. I just want to talk about the events surrounding the birth of Archie because this shit is nuts. So chapter 29 is called Pitching. So Mary, <laughs> Megan and Harry were looking for retaliation. This is the first sentence that I picked up on right here at the beginning of Pitching. Megan and Harry were looking for retaliation to the royal family the media, and the British public. What the fuck? Seriously, these two are so full of themselves at this point and so spoiled and just totally unaware in their own little bubble. They think they need to have retaliation against what now? The royal family, why? Because they gave them everything. The media, why? Because they're there when they want to advertise themselves. And the British public, why? Because they've been nothing but wonderful. What the hell is your problem, Harold and Fraud? What the hell? Hank and Skank, get your together. Okay, so Oprah and Gail. We found out in the last episode we went through it about basically they, Megan and Harry had already signed on to do this interview with Oprah. This is, of course, they're still in England at this point. They are planning their exodus, right? Their Megxit, if you will. So they have already been in talks with Oprah. We know this. We talked about this last time. So that's already been set. So they're there hanging out and thinking of how wonderful and perfect they are and how horrible everybody else is. They make this deal, right, that Oprah and Gail would produce a glowing CBS documentary about Meghan and Harry and the baby to try to build up their profile in America. So that way, when they do the interview with Oprah, there'd be much more public interest in it. Also, they decided that the best time to release such documentary would be after the baby was born. And in exchange, no other media would have access to Megan or her child. So just think about that. They sold their souls to Oprah and Gail. And they, um, although Megan is the devil, so I'm not sure how that works, but they, they made this agreement. Nobody else would have pictures. Mm-hmm. Does that make sense as to why the weird photo stuff with them and why they didn't do the photo call the royals typically do? Harry agreed that Buckingham would be given no choice. They would be given no choice as to any access to the baby and with media and all that CBS instead would be given exclusive of the baby and the situation. They also wanted the exclusive of the queen meeting Archie. Nice, huh? Real nice, really nice people that are doing this to the royal family and the queen who have given them everything. They are spoiled bastards. If I didn't hate them before, well, we're here we are. Because this is just awful. If they couldn't stand the royal family so much, why didn't they break free sooner. I'm saying break free like they would say it, but you know what I mean? Like, why didn't they leave sooner? Nope. They knew what they were doing. They knew that having this baby would get them all kinds of attention and press, and this could be their chance to turn their backs on the royal family, make it into a whole thing, and then sell their souls to CBS. So, yeah, Harry agreed to this because Harry has no nuts and no brain cells and he's eating crayons and he's not paying attention to what's going on. He let the devil herself make these deals and with herself, I guess, and he's just going along with it. But I'm not giving him a pass. He sucks too. I hate that guy. Now, get this. 
Okay. Mid-April, they decide to make an announcement that all plans around the baby will be kept private. Fine. Whatever. Their choice. Fine. They were going to release the hospital where the baby was born or the godparents. They wanted to keep that all private. Well, on cue, Miss Oprah started to sing the praises of Harry and Meghan and their decision. Their decision to protect the baby. I'm using Joey's air quotes. I'm looking at you, KT, um, <laughs> with Joey's air quotes. But seriously, they decided that Oprah should make these announcements, right? And sing the praises of them and their decision. So that way, do you see? It's like a, a mutual ass kissing. It's how Hollywood works, right? We'll kiss your ass. You kiss our ass. Great. Okay, we'll all get rich together. Meanwhile, let's turn our backs on the royal family. So Tom Bauer goes into why there's a royal protocol to this and that the announcements of royal births are essential for the newborn and legitimacy purposes. It's all to do with, you know, heirs and you, you, you get it. Hank and Skank are playing it up as we want privacy. Oprah's like, yeah, they're brave. They want privacy. But no, 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 no. That's not what it is. They needed total control over their narrative. They knew what they were doing. They purposely didn't want their baby photographed. So that way CBS could have exclusive rights. Never mind that again, there's just a royal protocol and it's kind of Think about Catherine, how when she has her baby, she goes out to the steps. Now, I have my own thoughts on that. Not Catherine. I love her. She can do no wrong. But I'm saying to me as an American, I think it's a bit extreme to go out two hours after having a baby and show, you know, whatever. But I understand why. I understand what they're saying. I understand the legitimacy thing. I understand that it's part of being a royal and paying back the public who loves you and who is part of this whole thing. I get it. They don't get it. Harold and fraud, but I get it. It makes sense. Again, the two hours after giving birth is a bit much, if you ask me. I do not know how Catherine can look so gorgeous right after having a baby. My God. Okay, so they were playing it up as privacy. But again, it was total control for them. They needed to control this narrative, aka make the big bucks and sell their souls to CBS. So May 5th, Megan went to Portland Hospital. It's a private hospital in London. Went in that night and the next morning, it was May the 6th at like 5 a.m. or 5.20 a.m., baby Archie was born. Now, P.S., if you have not listened to it, go back and listen to my episode of Spare where I specifically go into the birth. It is the most nonsensical bullshit story you've ever heard in your life. You talk about crazy story. That is one of the craziest from Spare. It doesn't get enough talked about. But I'll, I'll, I mean, go watch the whole video, but I'll sum it up for you. Harry claimed that he did a whole tank of laughing gas and Megan was like bouncing around on the exercise ball after having an epidural. None of it makes any sense. Go back and watch it. It's incredible. I've actually rewatched the video myself. It blows my mind. It blows my mind. I don't know why, but it does. Oh, immediately... After the baby was born, the deception starts. Well, that's what Tom Bauer says. I say they these two have been deceptive since they got together and even before that. So deception started immediately. And eight hours later, Buckingham announced that Megan was in labor. So think about this. So little baby Archie was born 5 a.m. Eight hours after that, Buckingham announces that she was in labor. Now, I don't he didn't say this part, and I'm just wondering, did were do you think Harold and Fraud were feeding Buckingham the wrong information on purpose? That would fit their agenda, right? If Buckingham wasn't fully aware and they were being super ambiguous, no wonder they announced it, you know, hours later. 20 minutes, this is where I get real pissy, 20 minutes after Buckingham announced that Megan was in labor, those two... Harold and Fraud jump on their Sussex Instagram. They announce the birth. They announce the birth of Archie on their Instagram. They announce the birth. So it's like, we don't care about family. You guys don't matter to us at all. We're just going to do our own thing over here, even though you guys are still supporting us. And Tom Bauer makes a point of saying, not only were they still being supported and free housing and all these <laughs> millions of dollars of renovation still obviously had security and all this. The, the reason I'm bringing this up is because this comes up in a little bit more lies. But yeah, all fully supported. And yet they can't even get the story straight with the palace. 
so, because they needed to make the announcement on their own Instagram. That's where their priorities are the day their baby was born. Buckingham realized that they had been fooled and Megan, again, Tom talks about that Megan was in total control. Obviously, this is deliberate. And Harry couldn't resist, but he had to go appear for media. He loves that shit. He can claim he hates the media all he wants. Clearly, he loves it because here we are. So he goes to talk about how excited he was and that Archie was there. Again, this is where things get nuts. I had forgotten about this until Tom clearly lays it out. Do you remember that they announced... They wanted Archie to have privacy. They do not want him to have titles. Do you remember that? Because I had blocked that part. There's so much bullshit that rose out of these two. I blocked it out. Yeah, they said they wanted little baby Archie not to have titles. Turns out that when Harry and Meghan got married, he became Earl and she became Countess of Dumberton. Dumbarton. Dumberton? I hope I'm saying that right. I mean, you know what I'm talking about. (laughs) Lord Dumbarton. Okay, that would be Archie's title. Well, you can imagine Megan threw a fit and said, heck no, no son of mine will be called dumb. Totally missing the point that that is the name of the area and that they are Earl and Countess of Dumbarton. And that, yeah, so he did get a title. They're so full of, you know what? Two days after the birth, Gail... Gail King, Oprah's BFF, was in Windsor for baby's first public appearance. So BBC and ITV cams were excluded, but CBS, come on in. Totally fine. It's, again, hey, you know, British people that have been supporting us and, you know, that we've been depending on and that we're so mad at because we think you don't like us, we're going to do something real mean. (laughs) They're just... So full of themselves, of course. Of course, they'd push out the British press, right? And welcome in the CBS, you know, Gail and Oprah. Come on in. Because they knew that they were headed for this interview with Oprah and they wanted themselves to be boosted up. So Meg timed the photo call, you know, the photo, that the first photo with the baby, with CBS Morning Show in New York. I just threw my papers down. Think about that. Everything had to be planned around this, this photo call. And it she planned it around the CBS morning show in New York. All right. The photo showed them together. They had everybody there. There was a photo of the queen and Dorian and, and you know, them there. And they're all staring at a little shawl. None were allowed to record Archie's face. Tom didn't say this, so I'm asking you guys, my courtiers, is it that... Um, Is it so they could drive a more expensive price so CBS could have the exclusive? Is that what it is? That's what I'm thinking. Gail, after this meeting, was able to negotiate a more, a better contract with CBS and doubled her fee to $11 million that year. That's her annual contract at that point. And it's all because of this. They're kissing each other's asses and scratching each other's backs and everything else. Any other analogy you want to make there, that's what they're doing. Once again, George Clooney, nobody asked for, jumps in and tries to defend Megan because she's being horrible and banning people like BBC and ITV and, you know, basically giving a big middle finger to the royal family and the British public. But George Clooney, for some reason, feels like he's their spokesman standing up for them for whatever reason. So here's the other part that I want to call attention to, okay? This is directly contradicting herself on the Oprah interview that she ends up giving two years later, right? First claims that they weren't asked to take a picture and that it was really damaging. So see that? She's spinning it like the royal family didn't want us to take a picture of our baby. No, that's not what happened. They did want a picture She and Harry decided that CBS was more important than their own family. They have great priorities, and that continues to show through, right? But then she admitted to Oprah that she had banned photos, right? So again, contradicting herself. They banned photos because, again, sounds like they wanted the first photos to go to CBS to make that big, big bucks. They claimed that Palace didn't offer Archie a title. We all remember them saying that, right? They wouldn't give our baby a title. Bullshit. He had a title. You just didn't like the one he gave. He was given. Also, this was very odd. She claimed that they didn't have security, 
Well, Tom Bauer, again, I'm a petty bitch. He seems to be one too. He says, well, she may not remember, (laughs) but they had security. Basically, he said she ought to have known that wasn't true, meaning she's lying. She's lying. She's lying. We all know it. It's just another lie. What else is new, right? She forgot her own announcement that Archie would be a private citizen without a title. Remember that? I talked about that a little bit ago. She said, no, we don't want him to have a title. But then when Oprah interviewed them a couple years later, it's they wouldn't give Archie a title. I mean, it's just never ending. Nothing is true with these two. It's all a spin and they're terrible people. And it's like, I know this, but it It shocks me. This part especially just really hit me of how vile these two are. She would tell Oprah that her child was not protected and did not have a title. It doesn't make sense. He was protected. He did have a title. They were trying to look out for him even more. But Dumb and Dumber, Hank and Skank would not clue in the royal family, the press office, all that. What was going on? The the palace, I meant. They wouldn't clue them in as to what was going on. They just expected them to follow along, but then use them, of course, to make themselves the victims. I just had to get on mic and put this out here because I, it just blows me away. And I'm very passionate about this because this is exactly why I'm working on this series. It's stuff like this. They directly contradict themselves. They tell these huge lies and then they act like we're all crazy because we're we call them out on say, that's not what you said five minutes ago. (laughs) So uh, let's take a deep breath. (sighs) Okay. I just had to get that on mic and I will pick up with more of revenge, but I'm just blown away. And I don't even know why I'm surprised by this, but I am talking about three, two, one revenge. (laughs) I've had so many of you saying now that you guys are saying it at home And that makes my heart so happy. I love having you here. And uh, you guys are my people. I'm excited to have our book club meeting. So for those reading along with me, I'm finishing up chapter 29 and we're covering all of chapter 30 in this one. And boy, is it interesting. Not looking so good for Hank and Skank. Things are not going well. So he goes into the christening of Archie and there's really not much juice there. So we're going to kind of breeze over it because, you know, I like to stick to the interesting stuff. But there is one thing of note. Apparently, Maggie Poo banned the palace photographer. So again, last episode, I go deep into this. If you didn't hear my last episode, you need to go watch it because it's going to piss you right off like it did me about how she favored CBS over the family because, you know, they hate the press, right? make it make sense. (laughs) So she banned the palace photographer from the christening, I guess, so she could sell her own photographs. Nice, huh? She kept the godparents secret. And again, that's not typically done with the royals. This is about the time where she put out that awful statement, quote, the same people who have been abusing me want me to serve my child up on a silver platter. Bitch, what are you even talking about? The media picked up on Megan being demanding. They started reporting her petulance and again, tantrums ensued. The tabloids that she was hungrily seeking attention from, she now made them her enemy. Again, it's just whatever suits them at the time. No rules apply to Harry and Megan and we will get more into that because we got stuff like that coming up that, you know, I don't even know that you'll be surprised about, but just more interesting things on that. He does go into her quote unquote friends. And I say that because, well, she's ditched most of them by now. But the way Tom Bauer explains it, they just use each other. That's how it works, right? They capitalize on each other. Jessica Maroney was using this situation to try to land a spot. She ended up landing a spot on TV for a little while because of it. I guess using the publicity that Misha, what's her, whatever her last name, who cares? She used this time to make a pop-up shop in London. She was capitalizing on her presence in London. Abigail Spencer, I remember her. She was annoying as shit on the, (laughs) was it the Netflix documentary? Who cares? She was also on Suits. She bragged about increasing her Instagram followers from 100,000 to 500,000. If you told me I had to hang out with Megan in order to have a boost like that, it's not worth it. It's not. It's really not. (laughs) Samantha Cohen about this time was leaving, so they started to bring in somebody else. It did not go well. 
Again, I'm just breezing over some of the stuff because honestly, this part was a little bit slow for me. Ooh, let's get into the interesting part. Okay. So Dumb and Dumber, Harold and Schmig, Hank and Skank, whatever you lovingly call them. I've had so many of you guys write so many funny things in the comments. Thank you for that. But uh, Harold and Fraud, which I also love. Okay, these two, they decide, you know what? Let's make a Sussex foundation. Okay, that's good in theory. You know, charity's good, philanthropy's good. Great, let's do that. Okay, except for Schmiggy Poo. <laughs> through a fit again I'm not even like speaking in hyperbole Tom Bauer actually describes it like throwing a fit but <laughs> she threw a fit because she'd have to be transparent let that sink in she was mad because she had to be transparent with a charitable foundation that she was trying to set up she thought she could do whatever she want and not have to report to anybody there seems to be a theme there as well right I want all the benefits I want none of the responsibilities sounds like Harold and fraud to a T right Megan was deemed a quote master of control she was not liking the legal requirements she hired I believe it was four business people to come in and help with this foundation. She thought that they would just be yes people. So she was actually surprised when they didn't do exactly what she wanted and tried to tell her, you can't just do what you want with these foundations. You have to be transparent. You have to show what money's come in, where it's gone, you know, as you do with a charity. <laughs> so what they do flash forward to now where they're in what Delaware and only have to give 5%. That's a whole other thing. Look into Archwell. Okay. Harry was pissy at this point because he was not liking William's treatment versus his own. I would say it wouldn't just be at that point. He seemed to, that seems to be a common theme with Harry. I mean, the whole book Spare was basically that. Somebody had done a word count in Spare and Willie, which is what he called William to demean him. That was the most used word in the book. So he talked about Willie more than he talked about his wife. He only mentioned Lilibet once, but he sure mentioned his Todger a lot. Ugh. Whew, I'm shivering. Yikes. <laughs> Megan later on admits that she and Harry were speaking about leaving England. Is anybody surprised by this? I'm not. Okay, let's keep moving. Harry's version of this is that it was Megan's, you know what I'm talking about, dark thoughts that spurred this. And he went on to Oprah and said, how dark does this have to get before we can get out of here? I don't know, you idiot. Didn't you brag about having a personal therapist, but you couldn't get that for your wife, huh? It's somebody else's fault because some unnamed person at the palace didn't help you in the way you thought that they would. This is, again, all according to them. And I don't believe anything that they say. <sighs> Take a deep breath, Jen. Okay, here we go. Megan told her California team to start looking for acting roles for her. <laughs> That's me cracking up at that prospect. How's that working out for you, Maggie? How's the acting going? I almost wish she would take on a role so we could all sit back and laugh and enjoy it together, right? I'll bring the popcorn. So it was around July they went to see The Lion King. Now, I wish Tom Bauer had gotten into it. He did not. So I'm going to get into it. This is the Lion King premiere in London that supposedly the actor from South Africa came up to Megan and said, when you married into the royal family, we danced in the streets like we did for Mandela. Okay. It's since been proven without a shadow of a doubt that did not happen. <laughs> the only South African actor in the company said, I did not say that. I think he even denies meeting Megan, but... Anyway, how crazy is that? It's just another easily provable lie, but yeah, she makes this shit up. This comes out in Oprah later, so uh, maybe we'll get to it when we get to the Oprah stuff, but he doesn't talk about it here, but this is supposedly where that happened. But also, can we talk for about 14 hours about this dress? I hate this dress. And I know what you're thinking. Oh, you just don't like Meghan Markle. Well, that is true, but <laughs> I was just trying to look at this dress and say, what is happening here? And I was trying to figure out what it is. It's just not tailored right. And I'm not even, I'm not even commenting on her body or anything like that. It's just the stress is terrible. It doesn't fit right. And it doesn't flatter anybody. I don't think it's a good length. And I don't, I just, I hate it, <laughs> which sucks because it's hard to fuck up a black dress, right? But they did it. Congratulations. Puckering around the top that I find odd, but also 
I'm noticing Harry's pants. What's up, High Waters? What's going on with these two? Of course, like everything else she says, people did interviews with the one South African actor, and he said, no, no, didn't say that. That never happened. <laughs> so again, who's got more motivation to lie here? Hmm. He thinks it's Maggie Poo for some reason. So Bauer does talk about it. The same show they were seen. It appears like they were hobnobbing, but actually they were pitching Megan for... <laughs> I can't get through this without laughing. They were pitching Megan for roles. They approached Bob Iger, you know, Disney guy. We're pitching Megan for voiceover work. They ended up... It did pay off because she ended up narrating... I believe it's called Elephants Without Borders. And supposedly the reviews are abysmal, but I'm sure... People have gotten in and given fake reviews, but yeah, she's supposed to be really horrible in that. Maybe I'll check that out at some point too, because yeah, it sounds like a mess. All right, so not enthusiastic reviews there. Next up, we head to Wimbledon, and she wanted to see her good pal Serena. And P.S. That's what I go. That's the listen, the episode I listened to in Patreon, where she talks to Serena, and I'm not even kidding. The first 20 minutes of it are her talking about herself and her damn hand soap again. There's no Serena. We kept waiting and waiting. I say we because my husband recorded it with me, but we kept waiting and waiting for Serena to come out and talk. I was more interested to hear what she had to say, but nah, Megan made it all about herself as she does about everything. This is where she threw a fit again. See a theme here where somebody was taking pictures of her. Imagine that. I thought she loved that, right? But she said she was in a private capacity. Well, no, you're not. <laughs> you're royal. You're in the royal press box or whatever it's called. The royal box. You're in the fancy place, right? <laughs> you're not sitting amongst the commoners. You are in the royal box. And then you're mad that people are taking pictures of you. I mean, just the lack of self-awareness. Again, isn't she supposed to have studied international relations? She's really bad at it, if that's the case. Here's a very elegant looking Megan with her tongue out again, because sure, why not? That seems to be a thing she likes to do in photos. I don't know if she thinks it's like cute or sweet or what, but no, it's no. Okay, so you guys can fill me in on this part because I tried to look and I found a couple of stories, but a lot of you have let me know in the comments. This is also the event, I believe, where she made people move that had bought tickets because she didn't want them too close to her. And more than just like her security stuff, I mean, like a couple rows in front of her, she wanted them moved for whatever reason. But also, um, this was where the lady, there was at least one person trying to take photos of Serena Williams and Megan accused her of trying to take photos of, of Megan. And the lady came out and said, no, I didn't even know who you were or care. I was trying to take photos of Serena. So I kind of love that story. Megan was so busy trying to convince us that she was a hardworking royal. But meanwhile, she only did one engagement. And it was for her charity that she had signed on for that SmartWorks. And otherwise, she just went to polo matches. This was a direct quote quote from Tom Bauer. So I'm not, I'm not even trying to talk shit here. It's the truth. She went to polo matches and took holidays on private jets with Harry and Archie. P.S. So many of you guys are so good. In the comments, you all brought up the fact, and I, I didn't even talk about it, that didn't she claim that the palace took her passport? That's interesting because she sure managed to go on a lot of different trips. Bauer goes into how she went to, I believe it was Sicily. She went to America to see her friend Venus Williams play. She went to uh, Ibiza, which we're going to get Ibiza, which we're going to get into. But still, remember the palace took her passport. So interesting that uh, she was able to do all of that traveling, right? So they wanted all the pluses of royal lives, but none of the, you know, work or obligation that that goes with it. Hmm. They were spiraling, continuing to spiral, and were an unhappy mess of pity and perceived victimhood. It continues. It's never ending with these two. They started to call upon their friends and say, hey, speak out on our behalf. Victimhood, right? It's so unfair. People are talking mean. She's being a royal bitch <laughs> to people saying, I'm private. Don't photograph me. That's my Megan voice. But yet she's calling on her 
celebrity friends to try to protect her. She won't, like, talk to the people who are actually there trying to help from the royal family and the working on behalf of the, the royal family. Nope, she'll call her celebrity friends. So Elton John spoke out and said, you know, we got to do something. <laughs> That's a Russell Brand reference. If you don't know what I'm talking about, forgetting Sarah Marshall. I love it. We got to do something. Like, no specific action. We just got to do something. It's like Harold talking about climate change. We got to do something, guys. Okay. Jessica Maroney was posting, guys, stop it. This is when she and Jessica were still friends before Jessica got ghosted. Oh, I could take about 14 hours to tell you how much I dislike Jamila Jamil. That lady sucks. If you don't know what I'm talking about, you need to jump, jump on your Google machine and find out about her. Now, I love The Good Place, so it actually pains me to talk about this because it's such a good show. But Jamila Jamil sucks. Um, definitely jump on the Googles and find out about her. But start with bees because that's hilarious. But apparently, how do I say this? Allegedly. I'll just say that Munchausen syndrome and... <laughs> Faking her illnesses has been associated in the press with Jamila Jamil. But that's not why I can't stand her. There's about a million reasons I can't stand her. And this gets interesting is because remember we discussed Caroline Flack. Now, unfortunately, she took herself out. She had dated Prince Harry at one point, And it all ties back into this Jamila character. And Pierce Morgan shared the DMs where Jamila was allegedly bullying Caroline Flack and that's it's hard to explain here but you need to google it basically Jamila got a bunch of people to pester and really bother Caroline Flack and then things got real bad from there and that's why Pierce called out that it's surreal that Jamila was trying to that Jamila has been speaking out against online harassment think about that okay so that's a little side trip with why I can't stand Jamila Jamil and I think she's a terrible person. She decided to help justify why they were taking so many private jets because the media was reporting on this as well. And we'll get more into the private jet things. Don't worry. Don't you worry. I got more stuff coming. Jamila was trying to justify the private jets. Believe me, she says some dumb shit later. We'll get into that. But she's a terrible person. Okay. Harry then during this time went to speak at a Google summit in Sicily. It's all about the climate crisis, global warning, all that stuff. How did Harry get there? Private jet. <laughs> I cannot make this stuff up. Tom Bauer points out there's actually 100 plus private jets there of all the people speaking on the climate crisis, global warming, etc. In his speech, he said every choice, every action makes a difference. We got to do something. We got to do. The arrogance was increasing during Harry's preaching. Harry then started to be questioned why why is it that about 60% of his flights around that time were private? He got mad. He didn't think he should be questioned. Again, this all sounds familiar. Nobody should question us. We're just going to preach, but nobody should question us. Um, he preached that it was his family's safety, so he had to. He had to tra travel on private plane, you guys. Harry believed himself and his, you know his bride <laughs> of Frankenstein, to be special and above questioning. That's because he's a spoiled brat who has no idea what's going on anywhere but his own little world. Meanwhile, during this time, the Cambridges flew commercial to their summer holiday in Aberdeen. They were going to meet up in Balmoral. Well, Megan took this as a dig on her because Megan thinks everything's about her. She threw a fit about it because how dare the Cambridges use common sense and... <laughs> act normal and human. No, 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 that won't do. So Megan threw a fit and announced, no, we are not going to Valmoral this year. She literally said, Archie is too young to travel by plane to Scotland. Okay. I just want you to think about that because you know what they did next? They flew him to Ibiza. <laughs> Seriously. What the hell? What in the hell? Oh God. All right, chapter 30, Vogue. Let's talk about this because it gets juicy. So remember, Maggie Poo had, there was controversy whether or not she had actually edited it, but supposedly edited the September issue. If you don't know Vogue, that's a huge issue that comes out every year. It's a big deal to people who care about that sort of thing. The actual editor of Vogue 
had been meeting with her and Tom Bauer alluded to there being potential problem, but he didn't explain it then, but he goes into it now. So apparently what was happening behind the scenes is Megan started making more demands. Megan, quote, wanted to break the internet. She wanted to have her say in everything, but apparently most of her contributions were completely superficial. I'm not shocked by that statement. Meg's decided that she could help publicity. She's trying to help Vogue, right? Get more publicity. So she thinks she can do it better. So what does she do? She has her friends start leaking snippets to the sun. Vogue was getting pissed. They said, we don't do that. We do better when it's like a surprise and the article comes out and people talk about it. But of course, Megan thinks she knows best all the time. Must be hard to be so perfect, you guys. I hope you can read the sarcasm in my voice there. Okay, so they get into this issue of Vogue. It's supposed to be about game changers. And they have people like Diane Fossey, Jane Fonda, Joni Mitchell, Toni Morrison, blah, blah, blah. You know who else is in there? Again, guess who had a hand in this? Bonnie Hammer. And you're like, hey, Jen, who's that? Well, I'll tell you. She works for NBC. And you know what? She cast Megan Suits. Interestingly from that, missing, uh, missing from the list, the queen. Hmm. Interesting. Megan really wanted to be on the cover of Vogue. The team had to explain to her, you don't want to do that. It would appear boastful. She later spun it as her own decision to not be on the cover, try to take a back seat on this. And uh, people that work there said, no, that's not what happened. She was pissed. So Salma Hayek ended up getting part of the cover or some. Di- I say it like that because I've seen it and there are a bunch of pictures on there. But I think Salma Hayek maybe was a focus on one of the covers. And not that it has anything to do with it. And it's a complete coincidence. I'm not shit talking Salma Hayek. I actually like her. But she's married to a French billionaire who happens to be Vogue's leading advertiser. Huh, imagine that. Weird coincidence, right? Okay, Buckingham Palace was completely, like, left out of the loop on this. So they're kind of blindsided by all this. Like, what? You did what? Again, she doesn't want to involve Buckingham Palace with any of her plans, except for when she needs their help. Then she gets them. Megan decided that she wanted American publications to have first dibs. Her plan was have it come out a day earlier in America because she thought she would be received better in America, to which I say, huh, how's that working out for you now? You're not being received too well in America right now. She thought she'd do better in America, so she wanted that publication to hit first and then the UK version to hit the next day. Well, Vogue was like, no, it doesn't work like that. We we launched the same day. What are you talking about? Well, she decided the palace could maybe make a demand on her behalf and it would be obeyed by Vogue. But guess what? While I don't give two shits about Vogue, I found this really funny. I believe his name is pronounced Einenful. He is the one that had worked with her on all of this. He's the editor of the British Vogue. He ignored her demands. So you can imagine how well that went. It pretty much ended their relationship. I'm sure he was doing a happy dance over that. And then when the issues actually hit, the press lambasted her. And I thought it was hilarious. They called her divisive. They said that when she's in a hole, she just keeps digging. Megan was making these demands of Vogue and its publicity department. And they were getting even more frustrated with her, which was not helping anything at all. The Daily Mail put out a thing saying, we Brits prefer true royalty over fashion royalty. Well... What did Megan do? She deemed it racist. It's interesting how when things don't go her way, that's the word she likes to throw around. Explain to me why that's racist. It's not. She's being ridiculous. That's her favorite thing to say. She was trying to spin it as promoting a happier life. But no, she's just clueless. She has no idea what she's talking about. It's all virtual virtue signaling. She calls her publicist demanding that celebrities endorse her during this time. They started talking to that Vogue guy, the Edenful, and he he refused. He's like, no, I'm not. <laughs> I've had enough of this bitch. I'm good. I'm not endorsing her. But again, this is where Jamila Jamil comes up. She's the worst. And no wonder she and Megan are friends. They can spin stories about bees together. Jamila Jamil jumped in on on the bandwagon and said, just admit it. Just say you hate her because she's black. I'm pausing on purpose. Just let that sink in. 
They literally have nothing else to go on. So that's what they're pulling at. Nobody else is bringing it up but them. I'm surprised that she didn't say it's because she's a woman. Or it's because she's, I don't know, you know, you name it. She'll pick something to grasp onto and that's the reason people hate her. It couldn't be her awful personality. It's because of these alleged isms that she pretends to face. Hey, we're talking revenge. You guys are the best. I'm so excited to be here. I love you all so much. I really appreciate all the lovely comments you leave me. I'm enjoying the heck out of reading them. And I passed 40,000 subs. So I'm thrilled. You guys are the greatest. Happy Friday, everybody. Let's make it a fantastic day, shall we? Now, we've got the nice cities out of the way. Are you ready to get, get pissed off? <laughs> because these two get real bad in this episode. I'm going to go ahead and give you a little preview. You know what? They go to South Africa and they talk about how hard things are for them. Think about what happens in South Africa and um, some of the things that are known to go on in certain areas of South Africa and these two talking about how tough things are for them. Kind of makes your head explode a little bit, right? Right. Okay. Let's get into this. Oh, I still have merch. Don't forget. Recollections may vary. That so much plays into today's episode because these two are making crap up and the queen is calling them out. And I love the queen and I can't wait to talk about how amazing she was through this whole thing. All right. Revenge. So I know a lot of you are reading along with me. I'm so excited about that. We are in chapter 31. Attack. (laughs) That's the name of the chapter. I just wanted to give it a fun voice. It's Friday. Come on, let's have some fun. (sighs) You guys, I want to have fun with this part. It's hard. These two are the worst. They truly are. I talk about it every episode, but I'm telling you, this one, it really struck me over the head how truly terrible these two are. So get this. Three weeks before what I'm about to talk about, they had declared... Archie was too young to fly to Aberdeen. And you're like, hey, Jen, what does that mean? Well, I'll tell you. And thanks for asking. (laughs) Thanks for asking how I am. Remember, that's Megan's whole thing. Thanks for asking. Nobody's asked me how I am. How are you? Um, (laughs) Should I say it with a fake tear left eye? Okay. (sighs) Nobody asked me how I am. (laughs) Oh, my God. Okay. I'm having fun today, you guys. Having fun. Okay. So they, oh, yeah. What am I talking about? Well, I'll tell you. I'll tell you, courtiers. Remember this? Because they end up flying to Ibiza right around the same time. And apparently he wasn't too young for for that. Huh. Interesting. You're telling me they lied? I'm shocked. So, well, again, apparently Archie, still that same age, decided he was okay to fly. And they flew him out to South Africa. They decided to take a 10-day trip. Now, of course, as we know, these trips are planned for months. So everybody was working toward this trip, right? The palace was really trying to help them get out there. Turns out, Dumb and Dumberton, and I wish I wish I had your name in front of me. Ah, oh, I need to pull that. Thank you so much for you who suggested. You know who you are. I love you. Dumb and Dumberton. That's perfect. Remember, that's a reference to... That was the name they took upon getting married, Earl and Countess of Dumberton. (sighs) I love the queen. She's so great, isn't she? I love that she gave them those names. She knew what she was doing. They had this trip planned, and Tom Bauer, I say it a lot. I'll say it again in case you're new here. Well, if you are new here, hit the subscribe button. I'm trying to grow. But if you are new here, I say this. Tom Bauer is so good at the things he says, but also the things he doesn't say. He leads you right up to it so you can make your own conclusion. So that's why sometimes it sounds like I'm jumping around. I promise I'm not. This is how he writes. He writes beautifully and entertaining, and but he lets you make your conclusions of this. Uh, we've made our conclusions. These two suck. <laughs> I think that's just a fact at this point. But basically the way I'm interpreting it, for legal reasons, um, is because... They did this as a, hey, look at us, aren't we fab tour? They'd been getting bad press back in in the UK. We talked about that. And nothing is ever their fault. And why learn from any of it or change anything? Let's just go to South Africa and pull the crap that they pulled. Get ready for this. Here's the interesting part. All right, so Harry was dealing with, quote, emotional turbulence. That's a very nice way of saying Harry lost his damn mind. He did some interviews, and again, this is in front of people who had, Tom Bauer goes into had suffered war crimes and poverty and 
like the worst of the worst things, right? Absolutely breaks your heart. Harold has the balls to stand up there and say, sometimes it's hard to get out of the bed in the morning talking about himself. He's not talking about these poor people who have dealt with everything. He's talking about himself and Megan, how hard it is on them, how hard they've had it, how they've had to deal with things like racism. Again, in South Africa, the nerve, the nerve of these people, the lack of self-awareness, it just makes me want to puke. So (laughs) Harry, again, uh, again, a direct quote, Harry spelled out suffering. So he's talking about his suffering to these people. I just, I just want to emphasize that. I just want you to think about that because that absolutely makes me sick. And again, points to the unawareness of these two. Um, They point to how Megan was also giving speeches and spoke of power, but with no real purpose. She really didn't know what she was talking about. It sounds like she was just, again, seems to be a lot of speaking with platitudes. Okay, so... This is not in the book, but this is where I'm going. It's like one of those people that hangs things on their walls. No offense if you have this, but the, (laughs) you know, the platitudes on your wall. Does it actually make you a better person if you read these things or say these things? Or do you just be a better person? That's just my two cents on that. Sorry if you like Hobby Lobby art. (laughs) Nothing wrong with Hobby Lobby. It's just their art, you know? Okay. Okay. I digress. Then Tom Bauer brings up how in a speech, Megan was talking about being a woman of color. Again, South Africa, talking about being a woman of color. But in the same sentence said, she hoped that it wasn't, she wasn't seen through a prism of race. What? Megan was believing that her success was allowing for entitlement. So that was still there. She hadn't dropped that or learned anything about that. The Media at this point, at the beginning of the tour, was actually still claiming that it was a success for the (laughs) Suckasses, Sussexes. Uh, They were saying it was a success. That's a tongue twister. Uh, They were still being painted in a positive light, but little did they know they were about to kamikaze that because they just can't help themselves. They can't just shut up and do good works. (laughs) But again, okay, I want to talk about big picture. Here they are in South Africa pretending to help. I don't, I'm saying that with a question mark at the end, pretending to what draw attention to suffering. I'm not really sure, but what do they do? They bring a camera crew with them. So while talking to the media and promoting themselves, they begin to say it with me, bash the media. (laughs) Where have we heard this before? God, God, give me strength. I'm going to write that on my wall. Maybe if I see it enough times, it will remind me. All right. So their stardom in South Africa, so they believed, they started to feel like, well, the palace isn't recognizing this. Tisk tisk. Meg- Megan felt that her global fame and fortune were destined if they just broke free of that darn palace. You know, the one that gave them their fame and fortune. Um, so... Then they started to turn, not started, they continued to turn on the press. And this is where they started getting obsessed with the mail on Sunday. And remember that letter to her dad? How could we forget that she wrote? Dear Daddy, you guys are so smart. You pointed out to me that she signed the damn letter, Meghan Markle. And if it was just a true letter from a daughter to a father who (laughs) never intended, I can't even say that laughing, never intended for the letter to get out, why is she signing it with her last name, right? So they decided, you know what, Daily Mail needs to go down. And they did it so, what's the word, without thought, impetuously, that they're like, just fuck it, let's sue. (laughs) So they were advised, you don't want to do this because they're going to drag things into light that you might not want to be brought into light, which speaking of, hello, Samantha Markle. Let's give that woman a round of applause because if you haven't seen, I'm sure you have. Samantha was just ruled that it's okay to go ahead and sue her sister for defamation. Yippee. That's awesome. I hope it goes. I'm not trying to be Debbie Downer, but there was just, when I read about it, they said there are plenty of ways that this could go away and may never see the light of day. I hope it does. You know what I hope for? I just hope that Hank and Skank have to give depositions and are questioned about a lot of things and have to give the truth. But I'm 
implying like they would give the truth. I don't think that they have any relationship with the truth. So I don't know. I just think that these two will pay to make it go away. Just a, sus- just a suspicion. Although they're so self-righteous, who knows? They might try to fight it. They don't think about anything. Okay, so back to this. Speaking of self-righteous, they thought, we're going to sue because you leaked Megan's letter that she never intended to get out. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Perfect handwriting, right? (laughs) Insane handwriting. They didn't think about, oh shit, we're going to have to actually tell the truth. What? We have to answer that we helped with things like the people article and stuff. What? Yeah, they didn't think of any of that, but they decided we need to do this right now. And from South Africa, they went ahead and launched the legal, legal battle against the mail on Sunday. They damned the press pack for Megan's coverage and talked about her being a quote victim of the press. Harry was claiming that the media created lie after lie at Megan's expense and she hadn't even been visible. All right, let's talk about this for a second. So he's claiming that the media created lie after lie at her expense because she wasn't visible. He's talking about when she was on maternity leave. Dum Dum didn't think this out. Megan had been to New York for her giant baby shower. Go watch my video on that if you don't know what I'm talking about there because it's pretty spectacular. Not the baby shower, just her attitude. And then after that, they jetted off to Morocco. So, you know, this is her not being visible. But also... He's claiming they created lie after lie about her, but he wouldn't identify what the lies were. So again, does this sound familiar? Because it does to me. That seems to be their thing. They give these vague statements and talk about anonymous people, but they never identify or name them. They just get pissed and they're not sure (laughs) who they're pissed at, right? Again, it's like a toddler. Just mad to be mad, right? So they... It was at this point, again, still in South Africa, that Harry played the Diana card. He starts talking about history repeating itself. Can I just point out that Bauer is so spot on? Think about everything we saw in Spare. He's obsessed with his mother and he's obsessed with the press. And that's exactly what Bauer is talking about. We see examples of it everywhere, especially here. I didn't even remember this part, you guys, but apparently Harry at this point said his mother, Diana, was, quote, chased to her death for being with somebody not white. I did not remember that. Bauer even says, what are you talking about? (laughs) That's not what happened. So instead of the South African tour being everything they hoped, turning their image around, it actually ended up failing spectacularly. Tom Bauer says that it ended in embarrassment. It was also during this tour where Megan did that interview with Tom Bradby, and I guess they had filmed kind of a mini documentary uh, while in South Africa. This is the same guy that recorded the interview with Harry where he refused to ask him any hard questions. They're good friends. Actually, he used to be friends with William as well, but it was this interview that, quote, terminated their relationship. But they spoke about their hatred of the media and all the lies being spread. And again, the Bradby guy did not ask a single question about what lies are you talking about and what do you mean and what's going on? But he sure didn't mind, I don't know, kissing their asses, helping spread these lies around. So Harry reveals in this that he had a fractured relationship with William. This is the famous interview where Bradby says to Megan, how are you doing? And she says, thank you. Thank you for asking me. Not many people have asked if I'm okay. Directly jabbing at the eye, the family that took care of these two losers. What I didn't realize is they'd filmed all this, right? They get back and they decide, you know what? Let's release this on the same day Catherine and William are headed to Pakistan. That seems to be a theme with them as well. Let's try to overshadow Catherine and William as much as possible. Good luck with that. Bauer calls it a wanton sabotage of the Cambridges. But again, Harry and Meghan were completely clueless because they dropped this, I don't know, mini documentary in an African backdrop to discuss their own pain and slight. It was at this point that Kensington Palace put out something to say that the Sussexes were in a, quote, fragile place. I would say Harry stays in a fragile place. Harry ain't that bright. So it had been three years since Harry and Meghan first got together, first met or whatever. And again, it just all happened in a whirlwind, right? As far as how fast they self-destructed, tried to take down the monarchy and it just didn't go so well for them. So that November, Hillary Clinton 
I don't get political here. I'm going to leave my thoughts out of this. I'm just reporting on what Tom Bauer says. Hillary Clinton came to visit her, Megan, at Frogmore and played into Megan feeling like a victim and misunderstood and tried to build up her ego or some shit. Who cares? Two weeks later, well, the first stage of Megan's leaving plan was announced. <laughs> of, I guess Harold and Fraud's leaving plan was announced. So they'd be doing six weeks on an island in Vancouver. They would be staying at Russian billionaire Yuri Milner's house. They would be taking six protection guards with them. And it was arranged by David Foster. Now, side note, my name, Real Housewives Recaps. I started off by recapping Real Housewives show and I still do some. But yeah, if, you, if you're like, who's David Foster? He was married to Yolanda who loved lemons. <laughs> I say it like that because that's how they said it on the show. But yeah, L Yolanda and her lemons was married to David Foster. Hello, my love. That's what she would say to him all the time. And he would get really pissy around the piano. He just seemed like a real dick. Anyway, that guy, he's neighbors with Oprah. But guess what? He's also good friends with the Mulroneys. So he, he helped arrange this Yuri Milner's house mansion on Vancouver Island for six weeks. Megan got in touch with her lawyers, her managers, and everybody she could in California. She was try trying to secure deals with Netflix and Spotify. <sighs> I'm shuddering because I've been covering that art, that archetypes on Spotify. And it is, you guys, I know I don't like her. I would tell you if I thought it was anything. It is the worst drivel I've ever heard. We listened to that thing for 20 minutes, waiting for her guest to come on, and all she could do was talk about herself and that damn soap story once again. Seriously, it's the worst. But Jay and I had fun making fun of it. Check it out on Patreon. So the Archwell Foundation was registered at this point in Delaware. But I didn't know about this, or I don't remember this. Apparently, they also registered... Loving Kindness Senior Care Incorporated to one Miss Doria Ragland, also registered in Delaware. Where are they going with that? Fill me in there, my cordias. What's going on with that? Is it like a shady thing? Is it a way to funnel money? Let me know. You don't have to be as transparent. And I believe they have a rule or law or something. As long as you give 5% of your whatever you make away, you, it counts. It's fine. They decided at this point that Buckingham Palace should bear the blame for the fallout of these two. This is what they decided. At this exact same time, and I don't go into this either, I have my own thoughts on this, but Andrew was having a disaster interview. He did that interview where he claims not to sweat. It was a complete disaster. Awful. Not good time. I feel for the queen. I really do. That's a lot to go through. You got Andrew being a disaster and Harry being a dickhead. So... The queen, though, God bless her, she took control. She decided, you know what? We're going to put focus on brand Cambridge. That's the future. Charles and William had made amends and become close again. William would take over more responsibilities, including managing the Duchy of Cornwall. This is where the monarchy being slimmed down started to come from. In the 2019 Christmas broadcast, this is where the queen talks about plans for the future and is talking about this sort of thing. Well... During this broadcast, she had four family photos behind her. She had a photo of her father. She had a photo of Prince Philip. She had a photo of Charles and Camilla. She had a photo of William and his family. And that was that. I also thought, I love Princess Anne. Where's she at? She needs to be on that desk. But I get it. I get it. I get it. They had to make a point. So <laughs> that was her point. And I love the queen. And... Harry was reportedly furious about this. He didn't understand why his family wouldn't be featured because Harry doesn't understand anything. That guy is eating crayons in the corner. No idea what's going on. But I'm sure Megan managed to make it all about her and threw around some ist words. Who knows? Up on chapter 32, transit. Oh, you guys, this is where it got. I just, this book is so good. I love it so much. Tom Bauer does such a great job. You know, I always sing his praises, but it's well-deserved. He wrote this so well, and he's, it's so interesting. So he gets into the isolation of Harry and Meghan. Remember, they had gone to Vancouver Island. We talked about that in the last episode. So they were, by them going over there, Tom Bauer is talking about how they're 
Uh, outrage was increasing during this time. I'm sure it was. They could just stew over on that island, right? And they started to adopt the word abandoned. They were feeling abandoned. Never mind that they're grown-ups that left their position, but they were feeling abandoned. They decided that they needed negotiation from Palace, and it they also decided it would not be discreet. And by they, I'm sure Tom Bauer was talking about Megan. Um, <laughs> I feel like, again, Harold is eating crayon, so whatever Ma- Megan tells him to do, that's what he does. He's like, are we outraged? We're outraged. Okay, I'm outraged. Okay, so I don't get political here. I'm just going to read a quote by Tom Bauer. Take this how you will. They were sure that the Sussex brand offered the same opportunities reaped by the Obamas. The idea being that they would give speeches, make a crap load of money, write some books. There you go. First step should be an Oprah interview. Hmm, where have we heard this before? In case you didn't listen to earlier episodes of our deep dive, which, hello, go back and listen to those. The Oprah thing started coming up right before they got married. And Megan said, it's not the right time now, but don't you worry, I'll be talking to you soon. Well, it's soon. (laughs) Harry believed his family would accept their, quote, demands when leaving. God, of course he did. The gall of these two, of course they think all their demands would be met, and it's totally, totally, totally a reasonable thing to do. So many of you guys have pointed out in the comments, I love you all so much, you write the best comments, but you pointed out things like, what job lets you make demands, leave, and still insist that you get a salary, a company car, and all the perks? No job. It doesn't work like that. They left their job. They should have left their titles and everything else behind. So after several phone calls with Charles, Harry was told he needs to start sending his proposals in writing. There's so many things that I would like to be a fly on the wall for, and that is one of them. I'd like to hear old Harold whining to Charles about how hard he's had it. Um, And uh, hear Charles' responses, like, you have to put that in writing. According to the book, the Sussexes' expectation was to, quote, retain their titles, their privileges, their income while living in Canada, that they would keep Frogmore. Now, remember, they just spent two point whatever million on renovations on that thing. They would enjoy (laughs) round-the-clock protection while costing the British taxpayers annually 2.5 million pounds. And their demand was to receive 1.5 million in annual income from the Duchy of Cornwall account. Remember, that's the account that funds both, I think, his household, William's household, and uh, it was something that Charles was over that he ended up putting William over. So in exchange, (laughs) I mean, just the nerve of these people. Can you imagine? In exchange, they would, quote, occasionally return to Britain, but otherwise represent the monarchy from Canada. So they had all this list of demands, and that's what they were willing to give. And, um, yeah, I, I, what? (laughs) What is it that they're offering there? Because I don't hear any benefit for the royal family or Canadians or anybody for that matter, except for... Harold and Fraud, they're getting all the benefit, of course. It just seems to be keeping with their theme of let's do, you know, let's do none of the work, none of the responsibilities, but boy, do we want those titles and that money that comes with it. That'll that'll be great. And the protection and stuff, right? All the advantages, none of the actual, you know, work that comes with it. So again, Charles is like, I'm sorry, what? <laughs> We're going to need that in writing. So Harry decides, you know what? I'm going to go to Gran. I'm going to go talk to the queen. And she said, no, 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 no. You're going to have to work that out with your dad. I love the queen so much. So this was after Christmas 2019. Dan Wooten got a tip that the Sussexes were going to leave Britain. When Harry f- found out that Dan Wooten knew, he blew a gasket. Again, that seems to be his thing. Anytime he can get mad at the press, he's happy about it. Apparently, it gives him purpose. So he demanded, I'm using Joey's quotation marks on that one, uh, that the palace take action against the sun. That's who Dan Wooten worked for at the time. So Harry was getting more paranoid. He couldn't fathom that it could be a member of his own team that's leaking this info. He assumed it was part of Charles or William's team that was leaking that they were they were planning to leave. 
Never mind the fact that it was true, right? That they actually were planning to leave. He'd rather just be mad at the press because nothing's ever their fault. I sound like a broken record, but that just is a repeating pattern with these two. Nothing is ever their fault. Let's be mad at everybody else. So Wooten at the time was a New Zealand holiday and he was trying to get the Sun to publish this information. Well, they wouldn't do it. Uh, there's a reason I bring this up where it's going to come back full circle. So from here, we go into January of 2020. It was actually January 6th. Harry and Meghan landed in Heathrow. They left Archie behind in Vancouver. Harry had planned to go directly to Sandringham for dinner with the Queen. But to his dismay, it was canceled. Well, no wonder. She was dealing with a whole bunch of crap. <laughs> and she didn't have time for his whiny ass. And so... He called to ask for another date that week, and she replied that her diary was full. Huh, imagine that. The queen's whole wide world didn't revolve around the suck asses, right? <laughs> yes, I'm a child, but I'm okay with it. He then spoke to Edward Young, who is the queen's private secretary. Harry threatened to announce his plans to leave Britain, and Young was like, are you crazy? Why would you do that before meeting with the queen? But, you know... Harry and Meghan, petulant children, they don't think things through. They just think by acting like this and demanding things, you know, that's going to work. That's going to win them favor. Look how that's worked out. Make it make sense, right? Make it make sense. Harry believed that the queen was, quote, receiving really bad advice. Now, this is what really pissed me off in the Netflix documentary and in his book. By saying that, he is taking power away from the queen. He's pretending like she wasn't the decision maker, that she was being fed things. And he even spun a story where she wasn't talking. It was his brother and dad yelling at him and stuff. And, and you know what, if that's the case, then she's probably like, yeah, he probably needs a little bit of yelling at to straighten up because it's just ridiculous. So the following night, the son coming back to that Wooten thing, he was back. He decided to publish Wooten's exclusive that the couple planned to step back and go live trouble-free in Canada. They also announced, the son did the Sussex Royal Foundation launch. Now, remember, that was what Harry and Smeg had come up with to, I, I don't know, allegedly, they were just asking for a friend about how to, you know, get away with putting some money in there and, you know, not having to... um handle it correctly. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge, allegedly, maybe. Okay. So they went to thank the high commissioner of Canada. Basically, let me cut through the bullshit here. They were trying to take a photo with them to promote themselves and to get attention and to show that they were serious about going to Canada. If the royal family wasn't going to speak up on their behalves, I mean, believe me, I don't think they should have, but I'm saying if in their eyes, if they felt like the royal family wasn't standing up for us, we're going to take matters into our own hands. Again, do you hear Megan's grubby little paws all, all over this? Because I do. So despite the imminent negotiations with the queen, their office, the Sussex office, issued a statement on Instagram, sure, Sussex, oh, but again, remember, we just came off where Megan was pretending she never did social media online. She never looked at it or anything. Sure. Yeah, this goes right along with that. Um, so they made this announcement that they would be stepping back as full-time senior royals and plan to, quote, carve out a progressive new role within the institution. You guys, their idea of a progressive new role in the institution is not doing shit, getting paid a lot of money, and becoming corporate spokespeople. We'll get into that, but that's their idea of a new role, apparently. They also referred to the launch of a new charitable entity, again, talking about that Sussex Royal. So this is about the time when Megxit was coined, and Megan wanted to take control of the situation. She booked a return to Vancouver the next day. She was pissed. So William was upset and Charles was exasperated. Harry later complained that the word Megxit, get ready for this, was a term of misogynistic abuse. What are we talking about? Couldn't it just be what it is, a play on the word Brexit that had been so much in the media, right? And then they're leaving. So Megxit just seems like the low-hanging fruit, but nope. 
not the perpetual victims, Harry and Meghan. They have to make it about themselves and make it how it's a misogynistic term. Are you not a man, Harry? Is that it was used at you too? <laughs> so, oh my God, maybe the cold medicine's making me loopy. But what are they talking about? All right, so the royal family needed to address this. Tom Bauer referred to it as an uncontrolled exploitation of their privileges and their titles. Ugh, you guys, I if there was something I could put my signature on to take those titles away, I think that's the first thing that should have gone. So according to the book, Harry had inherited $27 million from Diana. Meg, he, I don't know how he knew, he assumed had probably saved about $1 million from her suits career, but it was not sufficient enough to sustain their lives. Can you imagine? $28 million, not su su sufficient enough to, to sustain their lives. I, I can't even wrap my head around that. So the royals were in a predicament, right? If they let them keep their titles without responsibility, then they were afraid that Her Harold and Fraud were going to, Hank and Skank, were going to try to spend this, that they were the victims of racism and this was their prize on the way out, not the actual situation where they were just not interested in being working members and they wanted all the privileges. <sighs> Again, throwing out the ist words, so obnoxious. So 13th of January rolls around and Harry decides to go to Norfolk, which is, of course, Sandringham. He wanted Meghan there on Zoom. And I love this. The royal family was like, eh, eh, I don't think so. They were afraid she was going to try to broadcast it to other people or try to record it. Yep. Sounds like Schmeg. So at Sandringham, of course, was the queen. It was William. It was Charles. They had some advisors there whole bunch of people. Tom in his book states at this point, they all believe that Megan was controlling Harry. Uh, you think? No, I can cut through that. What that means is they knew how stupid Harry was and that she had him by the nuts. So, so there's that. Harry wanted to persuade the queen that they could serve the monarch and the royal family in a semi-detached manner from Canada. Again, this is your teenager saying, I'm leaving. That's it. But you still have to support me. What? No, I don't. Okay. So Harry didn't realize that half in and half out was not possible. I would say they weren't even looking to be half in and half out. I think it sounded like they only wanted to do like, I don't know, come to events, you know, right? <laughs> and be flown in for big events. Otherwise they wanted no part Tom Bauer goes on to say that Harry says at this point that he and Megan, quote, wouldn't be brand ambassadors of corporations. No, 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 we would never. <laughs> yeah, I'm laughing because we know how this goes and, and we'll get into it. But basically, immediately he turns around and does exactly that. He claims that he offered to personally pay for security. That is not what he's told us. He goes on and on, right, about how they would no longer protect us. They wouldn't. Remember, he did that whole thing. They wouldn't withdraw protection, would they? I'm being dramatic because that's exactly how he speaks. So this is where Tom Bauer goes into the press who had previously loved them when they were getting married, started to say, yeah, what the hell's their problem? Like, they're okay. People seem to be okay with them leaving but they're not okay publicly funding them and for them to keep their titles. Hello? And apparently this shocked Harold and Fraud. Again, it's just further proof that they live in their own little bubble. So Tom Bauer brings up this Tony Parsons of The Sun. He had apparently started out singing their praises and talking about how much he adored the couple. But then when this came out, he was just astonished how far they've fallen. Many of the, many of us would be happy to see the back of them as they leave. They call out the obnoxious behavior and how they demanded to have their cake and eat it too. And then Oprah, again, see how this all fits back? Oprah, Gail, Harry, and Meghan. They're all, whatever analogy you want to throw in here, like making money, right? They're all kissing each other's asses and making a whole bunch of money. So Oprah's magazine, Oprah magazine, um, put out a thing saying Megan hasn't been made to feel welcome by the royal family. So again, it keeps Oprah in the headlines. It keeps her magazine in the headlines. It keeps Megan in the headlines 
all laying the foundation for the interview to come. See how conveniently that works out for them? Wow, I'm shocked. I hope you can read the sarcasm through the cold medicine. So Megan's plan, according to Tom Bauer, was to expose the royal family as, you ready? You're going to be shocked. Racist. If her demands weren't met, is that not extortion if you've ever heard it? That is awful. Just awful. What's the word? Blackmail, extortion, all of it. All the terrible things. That's what that is. So that Tom Bradby guy, the more I learned about him, the more I dislike. He's the guy that interviewed Megan, did that interview where she was pretending to cry, saying, nobody's asked me how I'm doing, which some of you, I mean, you guys are the best. You pointed out my comments. She had a full face of makeup on for engagements that day, but then wiped it off to look more sad in that interview. Nice, huh? So he wrote about William not being welcoming and that they escaped from the, quote, poisonous palace. So again, it suits his narrative and also builds his interview back up, right? And of course, we know since then they've done another interview. So it's interesting how they're all, I'm really bad with these analogies. What is it? Greasing each other's pockets? That. (laughs) They're all getting paid, right? Then the media starts to, the ones that are siding with Harold and Fraud, which I don't understand how anybody does at this point, but they do. Uh, They blamed Mexit on structural racism and sexism. It couldn't possibly be that these two are the absolute worst, didn't actually want to take the job seriously. Tom Bauer even refers to the Duchess's lack of interest in her duties, but that's all irrelevant. No, no, no. It's all the isms and the is that they like to blame so much. So much talk of her race. And this is where Harry, Harry and Meghan, Hank and Skank, Carol and Fraud, start to blame Britain's intolerance. I'm using Joey's quotation marks again. How about that? So if you don't support these people, you're intolerant? I just think it's completely irresponsible and disgusting to make blanket statements like that. It doesn't matter somebody's gender, race, etc., you can be an asshole regardless, right? (laughs) And that's exactly what they're being and so much worse. And yet, if you call them out on it, here we are back at the ist words again. It's so obnoxious and it just shows that they can't think for themselves. Let's just go on this group think idea. Oh God, it's just disgusting. Okay, so the queen was trying to keep things civil and said, hey, let's try this trial separation. Sometime in Canada, sometime in Britain. Let's split some time up here. Tom Bauer points out that Megan at this time felt no qualms about who she who she was insulting. They call this the Sandringham Agreement, this part-time Britain, part-time Canada thing. The Sussexes would no longer be working members of the royal family. They would no longer use HRH titles. I'm throwing my hands up in the air just like you are. I I can hear you screaming at your TV too. I hear it. Harry would lose his military roles. Megan would lose her role within the Commonwealth and that they would be forced to repay the 2.4 million they spent on whatever, redoing Frogmore. And in one year, they would lose all financial support. So I would say, what the crap are we doing here? Why do they even get a year of financial support? To stomp on everybody on the way out and still get a year of financial support is way too generous for these two. Harry and Meghan assured the family they would never use royal titles to make money. I'm laughing because that's all they have done. How about the question that Anderson Cooper asked about giving up royal, I think it was him that asked that, royal titles and Harry just kind of sidestepped it and said, well, what difference would that make? It's because you're banking on it, you butthead. So they agreed to express mutual platitudes of each other. Harry and Meghan and the royal family would be nice to each other in the press, uphold the values of Her Majesty. Harry then returned to Vancouver. He and Meghan shared a sense of grievance. Again, where have we heard this? Of course they do. They get all these things that they don't deserve, and yet they're still the ones holding a grudge and having a grievance. So early February, the protection officers that were there for Harry and Meghan informed the palace that Meghan was house hunting in Malibu. Tom Bauer says that living in Canada was a smokescreen. According to the Sussex version, security was going to be removed with short notice. 
but their house was not safe. It was a lack of support and understanding. So again, they're continuing to smear the royal family. And we just found out all the ways that the royal family was continued to support these assholes. The principal enemy that they seem to have was very unclear. It seems to be the tabloids. And Harry kept speaking in these nonsensical things about standing up for what they believe. What is it that you believe? In money? Exploiting? <laughs> what is it? Reaping the benefits with no actual work? What is it that you believe in? So one of my favorite quotes from this part of the book, Tom Bauer says, and I quote, logic played no part in the Sussex's conduct. Then we find out immediately after this, Gail King, again, do you see full circle? Oprah Gail and these two. Gail King hosted a JP Morgan event in Miami. Guess which ginger was flown out from Vancouver and earned $1 million for exposing his, quote, wounds. <laughs> yep. So just what they said they weren't going to do, using their titles, exploiting the family for money, look what they've done. He preached about having no regrets, leaving the royal family, and then he had to, quote, protect his family from what? He doesn't know. From not making a shitload of money and selling his family out? I guess that's it. So the exact thing he's promising not to do, he does. He uses the royal titles to make money. He's a corporate shill. There you go. The palace wanted them to shut down the Sussex Royal brand. You can imagine how that went. The 31st of March, the Sussexes made this announcement that they were stepping down from being working royals. Whatever they were pretending to be at that time, they were no longer pretending. Well, Canada withdrew their funding for protection. So again, these two demanding everything, but... <laughs> um, but you can expect nothing in return from them. They're stepping down, but they still expected that the funding from the Canadians would be there. Tom Bauer estimated to maintain their lifestyle, they would need to earn about $10 million a year. I'm thinking it's probably more than that since they've made their way to Montecito. So in a statement, they took a swipe at the Queen, who they say had no jurisdiction over the word, quote, royal. Harry was HRH by birth. This is where I hate them. That is awful. They're still using these titles, and I, I just wish there was something that could be, there's got to be something that could be done, and I wish that Charles would do it. Megan told her people in California to find a director for Archwell, and that is how that chapter ends. So we are going to dive into chapter 33, Farewell, on the next episode. Guys, this is some juicy stuff. These two are the worst. Every time I think I can't hate them more, they go and do stuff like this and remind me, oh yeah, yeah, I do. I hate them even more. They are truly terrible people. The most selfish entitled people I believe I've ever heard about. They really are pieces of work and pieces of shit. So there's that. So we pick back up. We finish up with chapter 33, Farewell. So this episode, I'm going to get into chapter 34. There really wasn't too much to chapter 34, but then we get into chapter 35, The Trial. That's the one where Megan is fighting with the mail on Sunday. Remember, for breach of privacy in regards to the letter to her father, which she sure didn't mind leaking in the People Magazine article, but she didn't want that whole thing out there. She didn't want people to realize what a villain she was, so she was fighting. So we'll get into that. We'll get into her lap dog. We'll get into her lap dog, Omid Scoby. That guy's popping up more in this episode. Lots to talk about. All right. So we pick up with Harry saying about Megan, she saved me. Saved you from what? Being nice to your family? Yep, she sure saved you from that. So March 2020 happens, and it's their last trip to London before, I don't know, the victimhood swallowed them whole. So they had a dramatic finale. Remember the pictures with the umbrella and the blue dress, and they're like looking at each other like, we did it. We survived. Survived what? My God, you two. So March rolls around, and Harry's told that he and Megan couldn't join the family on the balcony for the Commonwealth service. Well, while they're happy to walk away from any duties, they were not happy to walk away from the privilege of standing up there waving to 
well, I guess riding the heels of people like the Queen and um, Catherine and William's adoring fans. <laughs> but they were not happy about that. So he, Harry was told that for this Commonwealth service, he and Meghan would sit with the congregation. Well, the isolation appearing in public humiliated them. These are Tom Bowers' words. So <laughs> I find that hilarious. I hope it did and enjoy that. I mean, the fact that they're even allowed there is more generous than I would have been is, you know. Okay, so Harry looks strained. Megan face showed bemusement. Bauer is pointing out that even on her last day, Megan couldn't understand why her demands were not being met. Again, just the idea that the family works together. It's not all about Megan. Couldn't wrap her head around that. She ended up flying to Vancouver from Heathrow. Is this the flight, I believe, where she claims that that man got down and said, thank you, thank you for your service. Like she did something honorable or something. I don't know. Oh, God, you guys. It's just so thick with bullshit. So thick. Bauer goes into how the palace did absolutely everything to welcome her. From arranging adventures to, you know, funding her wedding, her house, her staff, giving her the foreign tours and very limited duties, anything that they could to make her feel more comfortable. And yet she loves to sing that tune, how nobody helped her, even though it turns out she had a team of, I believe it was 15. I think it was um, the lead person and then 14 under her. So... You know, she was given nothing, you guys. A team of 15, a house, tens of millions of dollar wedding. <laughs> but she was given nothing. Poor survivor, right? Wow. I just don't even know how you spin that story in your own mind. I mean, I know she's a narcissist. She doesn't think like normal people. But I just, I can't wrap my head around that. If somebody gives me like a $20 gift, I'm writing them a thank you, right? Like, <laughs> it's just crazy, crazy. So Bauer points out at this point, the nation was kind of divided on Harry and Meghan. You know, people seemed to be okay with them leaving if they wanted to leave, but they didn't need to go out like this. And they were perple perplexed by Meghan's lament. I gave up my entire life for this family. Uh, you'd only been there, what, like three years? I think it was three years in Britain. So what exactly did you give up? We already knew she was being written out of suits, allegedly, and that nothing else was popping up. Bauer went into that. So what? what is it that you're giving up? Okay, during this time, the Sussexes were still setting up California stuff. They were setting up the Archwell, whatever. I'm going to use the word foundation, but I don't... <laughs> There's been newer developments into that. Don't believe it's a foundation. They were trying to launch themselves as, quote, global influencers. Archwell at this point was described as a nonprofit. And I'm laughing because, again, deep dive, just Google, Google Archwell nonprofit and see what pops up because you'll find out there's lots of um, stuff going on there. So, so. Supposedly, they didn't have any money in that fund yet, and no clear wording of how private funds would be divided versus the nonprofit side of things. But you know what? Don't let logistics bog you down. <laughs> Just make it up as you go along. That seems to be Harry and Meghan's thing, right? So March 2020, Harry and Meghan took a private flight between Vancouver and Los Angeles, and they ended up at an $18 million Beverly Ridge compound. Megan returned to California after nine years of being gone. So because of the global crisis going on, Harry and Meg thought it'd be a good idea to put out a statement about how they're thinking of people and uh, just still turn it around on themselves. A lot of self-pity and lack of self-awareness there. Meanwhile, the queen gave a stirring and very genuine speech about we'll meet again. Um, versus Harry and Meghan's vapid self-centeredness. The public was starting to classify these two as self-pitying celebrities, and I love that so much. Okay, we get into chapter 34, Paradise. So May 2020, they ended up in a nine-bedroom, 18,000-square-foot Montecito mansion. 14.65 million, eight acres. It included a gym, spa, cinema, and five-car garage. Who are their neighbors, you ask? Well, I'm glad you ask. 
Ellen, hey, that's weird, right? Because Megan and Ellen did something together. Oprah, hey, that's weird because we know about the ties between Oprah and these two. Gail King, again, weird, right? Because we know about the ties between Megan and Harry, Oprah and Gail. Head of Netflix was nearby. Gwyneth Paltrow, Katy Perry, David Foster. They seem to like to scratch each other's backs there, huh? All right, so they're getting embedded in Hollywood. Ugh, even that sentence makes me want to barf. Harry gave speeches about unconscious bias. Again, where have we heard this, right? This has come up quite a bit. It was during this time that Harry attacked the Commonwealth as colonial and, quote, racist. But just weeks earlier, he spoke to the Commonwealth and gave unquestioning praise and talked about his grandmother's work. So interesting how in a few short weeks that changed. Omid Scobie, yep, I hate talking about him too, but he started to speak out against the Commonwealth. Interesting how that was working, right? It's almost like Megan had a hand in that. <gasps> what? They were becoming more loud and more obnoxious, and as they did, the public favor of these two was decreasing. They had it made people have decreased positive feelings. And Tom Bauer points out that at this point, they were still popular in America. I would like to point out I am in America, and I disagree. Because I, for me, it was the South Africa thing. When they were, when she gave that interview, nobody's asked me about me while standing in South Africa. <laughs> you know, where people have real problems and stuff. And yet, she's saying nobody asked her about her. That's where I was like, yeah, I'm done with these two. All right, so let's get into chapter 35, the trial. So Harry's got ongoing mental health stuff, right? I'm not going to make fun of him for that. I get it. It sucks. What I am going to talk about is that he loves to use this and blame the media for it. He blames the media campaign and he goes against the tabloids. So again, nothing's ever their fault. So of course, why not blame the media? It couldn't be that you have your own mental struggles going on. They, at this point, launched their claim for breach of privacy made against the mail on Sunday. They call that dishonesty and malicious intent. And if you're just joining, we've been talking about this case a little bit in some of the episodes, but it's where they got a hold of the, the letter that was sent to her dad. The one that she clearly wanted out, but then could claim victimhood when it did get out. So she's claiming breach of privacy and malicious intent, even though she wrote the letter. <laughs> I mean, again, wade through the bullshit there, right? Thomas points out that by Megan suing the mail on Sunday, that's her way of showing she just wouldn't believe the media's portrayal of herself. She, during this time, was repeatedly advocating compassion. It was even talked about on Archwell. I believe they said it was the website it was talked about. That part of the whatever bullshit platitude statement was one act of compassion at a time. And yet that is not something that she is willing to. She's she's not practicing what she's preaching, right? In terms of her dad, especially. But, well, it seems to be a theme because, yeah, that just seems to be ongoing with those two. Jeremy Clarkson comes to mind. So they were going to high court trial on privacy. And Tom Bauer explains that, I guess, in the UK, it's a little different. You do these pre-trial meetings to determine what's going to be allowed and what's not. And it kind of sets the stage for the trial going forward. So the male side was arguing during this time that there was no expectation of privacy, that the letter was written with the expectation that it might be leaked. Hello, she signed it, Meghan Markle. She wrote it in that ridiculous font. She knew what she was doing. She knew it would be leaked. She started it with daddy. Of course she knew it was going to be leaked. Oh, the other point that they made is Thomas had a right to speak out against the claims that he hadn't been trying to contact her. And then the third point that they made is Le Megan leaked part of the letter herself in that People magazine article. Okay, so remember how I was just saying in the UK, apparently, I guess trials are just done a little bit differently. So in this first part of the trial, a judge ordered Megan to pay 67,888 pounds which ended up being the cost for that hearing in full. He dismissed part of her claims as irrelevant. Megan had claimed that the Mail on Sunday acted, quote, dishonestly 
by leaving out passages of the letter, and he struck that part down. So as this was part of the pre-trial of it all, again, I'm trying to make sense of the UK stuff versus the things I know about American court. The way I'm understanding it is part of the pre-trial it was during this time Megan changed up her strategy. She ended up replacing some of her counsel, and she took on this thing where she was vocally criticizing the palace advisors and blaming Knopf for not, I don't know, speaking out more on her behalf. It's ridiculous. It was also during this time that the Finding Freedom stuff was coming up. Omid Scobie was saying that there were no tears from anyone before the wedding, so apparently at that point Megan had forgotten her story or changed it once again would later become where she said, no, Kate made me cry instead of what we already found out, which is she made Catherine cry. All right. So media criticism was totally unacceptable to Harry and Meghan, but they sure didn't mind assisting Scobie in criticizing the royal family, going to the media to criticize others, but it was not acceptable when it was aimed at them. Well, then Megan once again changed her truth. She started saying that she and Harry did not collaborate with Scobie. They were not interviewed for it, even though we already know that Knopf had passed on the 20 whatever it was questions from Scobie. She decided at this point, oh, no, 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 we didn't help, even though clearly she had. She described allegations that she had helped work on this Finding Freedom freedom with Scobie as false, fantastical, and a, quote, conspiracy theory. She denied being able to make changes on Finding Freedom and being able to fact check it. Okay, we already know what a control freak Megan was. There is no way if her lap dog was writing this book that she wouldn't have her grubby paws all in it. We already know this. Megan's truth was supported by Omid Scobie. Imagine that, huh? You mean her best friend is supporting whatever version of truth she's spinning at that moment? I'm shocked. So September rolls around and Omid signs a statement saying he didn't have any help from the Duke and Duchess. Okay. He signed a misleading statement to help them in their trial against the mail on Sunday. Huh? That's interesting. You mean he lied to help his friends? What? So our lawyers were claiming that the letter was, quote, private, personal, and sensitive. The male argued, well, she anticipated being leaked. The male argued that she anticipated it being leaked and breached her own privacy by letting her friends speak up to People Magazine on her behalf. There were 49 examples listed as evidence that she indeed did work with Omid Scobie. Shocker. Details so precise were given in this book, like who said I love you first and things like that, that it could have only come from the Sussexes. She would later assert that she, quote, forgot her conversations, her emails, and her two-page memo to Knopf. That's interesting that they can forget things like that and yet remember every grievance ever in the book spare. Hmm. Weird how that works, right? If it benefits them, you know? So basically, if she were to admit that she'd worked with Scobie, her case would then go on to trial. That would not be good. She was pushing for a summary judgment because she didn't want to be subjected to cross-examination. So she was cooperating with Scobie's flattering account of her in Finding Freedom and totally okay with excerpts of her letter being quoted in the book. And yet she objected to the Mail on Sunday publishing the letter because they hate the media when it doesn't suit them exactly. Okay, so you ready for this? Seven weeks later, she changes her statement again. She's like, oh yeah, that's right. I did allow a friend talk to Scobie just to set the record straight, not for my own benefit. I'm not lying, you guys. I mean, I'm just aghast at this one. It, it just so much reminds me of Amber Heard. I cannot help but bring that up. That's all I can think about is the way that the lies change. And it's just so crazy because it's all verifiable stuff. But no, it doesn't matter if it suits her. She's going to spin a tale about it. But the victimhood mentality continues to rear its head because she claims she only did this to make sure 
the people knew that she didn't abandon her father, which is exactly what she did. And instead of just dealing with it and talking to her father about it, she'd rather go to all these lengths and continue this victimhood mentality and narrative. It was at this point she tried to hide behind the communications team of the palace and say, I don't know what it, what extent that they were helping Omid with this book, forgetting that she had written a two-page memo to Knopf detailing exactly what she wanted to say in the book and in this meeting with Omid. An interesting thing that came out in this part of the book is that she finally admits that the letter was not an in- the letter's intent was not reconciliation. But isn't that different than the story we heard earlier that she had acted like that's exactly why she was writing him? And that's why she didn't want the entire letter published because people would be able to see, oh, hey, she's just being a mega bitch again. She can't she can't keep her story straight and neither could Omid because Omid in the book, apparently, I haven't read the book. I keep I kicked out the idea of reading it maybe together. I don't know if I can stomach it, you guys. If we did, it'd just have to be like one video because I can't handle that guy. But he apparently in the book, according to Bauer, claims that he did speak to Megan, but then signed a statement in court saying, oh, no, he didn't speak to her. So apparently none of them can keep their story straight. So according to Bauer, after all this came out, Megan was again ordered to pay lawyer's fees totaling 178,000 pounds. This is the part, again, where American courts, I guess, are just a little different. I, I hadn't heard of this, where you do it in stages like that, and I find it so fascinating. I don't I don't remember this part of the book, so it's interesting to reread it and to know these details. The chapter wraps up by saying, while all this was going on, Megan was just enjoying the sunshine out in California and laying the groundwork for her big appearance, dun dun dun, Oprah, and trying to brand Megan as an influencer, and I'm laughing because again she's been in hiding since uh, since everything's gone down in real time, and I find that very fascinating. Anyway, revenge, the dumb prince and his stupid wife. I'll never not think that's funny, by the way. All right, jigsaw. So. He calls it Jigsaw because immediately he starts discussing Megan's team was tasked with slotting the pieces of her compassion, her victimhood, um, fake news, racism, feminism, motherhood. Each piece of the Jigsaw was meant to illustrate Megan's suffering. Ugh. I'm going to have to take some major anti-nausea medicine for this part of the book because it really made me feel queasy because it's all about that. They want you to know how much poor Meg Poo has suffered. I'm going to get into it, but I'm going to go ahead and jump ahead and tell you when I get into the part about bullying the staff and then her answer to it is, I couldn't have bullied them. I myself am the victim of bullying. I just want I just, I, I want to throw up. I want to throw up on my table and I hate talking about gross stuff like that, but I'm telling you, it made me nauseous. <laughs> If you could see me right now, I'm I'm like holding back, you know what? Oh, it's so gross. They are disgusting. And it's like, there's times where I just think they're annoying, but then I remember, oh no, they're truly terrible human beings. And we'll, we'll get into all the whys. We already know all the whys, but we'll get into more of the whys as we continue reading. But she was advocating, get ready to laugh, quote, stop the hate for profit. Okay. Mm hmm. Uh, what would you say you guys didn't spare in every interview since you've left? Hmm. Hate for profit. Interesting. Yeah. Again, the rules don't apply to them. So, right after, let's see, I'm jumping around, but right after they had left, she started doing these speeches, right? That her slogan was build compassion around the world. And that's interesting because she doesn't have any compassion for those around her, such as her father. Megan was invited to speak at this most powerful women's summit. You guys, it was a virtual summit in 2020. The cost? Well, I'm glad you asked. $2,426 a piece. Who is going to the stupid thing? Megan was featured in the, quote, courageous leadership section. I mean... What is happening here? Just a bunch of rich people who are sheep? What's what's going on? Who's going to try to learn anything from 
from her. That's just disgusting. She described herself as, quote, the most trolled person in the entire world. um, Referring back to 2019. But, oh my God. Again, it's all about being a victim while victimizing other people. It's just disgusting. And, and I think my old saying fits. And if you're new here, you'll not get this. But if you've been with me, you'll understand it's a load of pants. This is a load of pants. This is more than a load of pants. This is making me nauseous. Seriously. (sighs) She contradicted herself. What else is new by talking about the hate toward her online. But remember, she had claimed that she doesn't read any of that stuff, you guys. She doesn't read social media. Remember, I played the condescending clip a few episodes ago. Go back and find that if you didn't watch it. It will, again, invoke a gag reflex. But she had, yeah, previously declared, I don't know what's helpful. I, God, I'm mixing up her words because I'm, I'm going cross-eyed because I'm nauseous. No, she said, I don't know what's out there. And that's helpful for me not to know. Okay. She was still posting as, quote, the Duchess of Sussex. What else is new? She will not let go of that title. She sure hates everything to do with the royal family, but she sure loves that title. While trying to commiserate with others suffering during lockdown, she was still signing off as the Duchess of Sussex. Ugh. I mean, the lack of self-awareness. She started endorsing political parties, which is something that the royals do not do. They don't get into politics. During this time, they were working on their Spotify deal, which they, Tom Bauer had estimated they made between 18 and $30 million on a Spotify deal. Uh, Didn't that guy, didn't the Spotify guy come out since then and say he spent too much? I think he included a couple people in that, but they were one of them that he spent too much on the uh, Spotify deal, which I kind of love if he said that. Netflix, they are estimated to earn around $100 million. Now, it's easy to hear numbers like that, and, and that number is disgusting. I'm not trying to downplay that. But then think about, you know, all the people they had to split the money with. But they still walked away with a huge chunk of change there. Jeez. I just, I think I get so frustrated for so many reasons. The bullying thing is just the worst to me. The way that she treated staff. The way that it's come out that she's spoken to people and the way we've seen her through everything from body language to just clips of her treating people is so disgusting to me. It really, it does, it makes me, I have a visceral reaction to it and the holier than thou, I think of the two of them just really disgusts me. And then the, the other thing, and this is where I get hung up on these numbers. It's not that I dislike rich people. Hey, I wish I was one of them, you know, (laughs) bring it on. But I think all the good you could do if you were, you know, given a platform like that or given huge sums of money like that. But nah, not these two. They'll just keep preaching on their victimhood and whatever else they're peddling at the time. So during this time, William and the Queen were working hard and making appearances together and trying to help during the COVID situation. Bauer is saying behind the scenes, Harry was fuming about this. Harry had this idea to lay some wreaths down for fallen soldiers, but in doing so, he made sure that photography was there and that the photos were distributed and circulated to show that he is still, what's the word? He's still relevant. He's still... He hasn't abandoned his royalty. Okay. Megan at this time was supporting cancel culture. It's a whole thing. She was for the censorship of certain people that she opposed on Twitter. And again, it's funny how she doesn't want to be canceled, but she sure doesn't mind canceling everybody else. All right. So also during this time, Christmas rolled around. They decided, well, who should we spend Christmas with since we isolated ourselves from both families and cut them all off? We don't need those people. Let's spend it with David Foster and Catherine McPhee. I'm sorry, can you think of a more insufferable group of people? Because I can't. That sounds awful. So during this time, Megan and Oprah were closer than ever, scratching each other's backs. They were priming for this interview. Oprah was repeating claims of Megan's victimhood. It was these claims that made her ideal for Oprah, who some say might uh, exploit people who have been victims of certain things. Just saying. Okay, so then we get into chapter 37, Netflix. 
so right off the bat in this chapter, we're hit with the story of Harry appearing on James Corden's show. And I cannot stand James Corden. Lump him right in there with Jamila Jamil is some of the most obnoxious people ever. But of course he's friends with Harry and Meghan. But um, a really funny thing is, according to Tom Bauer, follow me here. According to Tom Bauer, according to a producer that worked with James Corden, um, Harry had pestered Corden to appear. And that's how that interview came about. I just find that very funny. Of course he did. Of course I wanted to try to stay relevant and appear on TV. And I'll tell you honestly, I watched it. Even though I can't stand Corden, I thought, oh, it might be funny. Who knows? We'll try it. I just I just remember thinking, God, he has no personality at all. He just came off as unlikable. I don't know. Unrelatable something. Not friendly, not personable, not charismatic. I don't Whatever the opposite of all those things. Is. Prince Harry, that's what he came off as. During this, he ended up praising the crown. So think about this. Okay. He's praising the crown, who notoriously had, and I know people like the crown. I don't care. Like the crown, don't like the crown, don't admire me. It's kind of been a thing, right, where they've kind of gone after the royal family a little bit. And um, he's praising them, but bear in mind, he's praising them on James Corden, you know, a national show, all these people watch. He was, during this time, contracted to Netflix. So, of course, he's going to, you know, it's all about kissing each other's asses. So, of course, he's going to do that with Netflix. And so this broadcast of this James Corden thing aired on February 21st, the same night that Prince Philip was going back into hospital. They, you know, it was near the end of his time. And, of course, no mention of that. Prince Harry all about himself. Also, on this night, the Queen was on TV discussing COVID and, you know, trying to help people. But, nope. There's Harry riding on a double-decker bus. I don't know, being silly and drinking tea, whatever. Okay, and then around this time, they also did their first Archwell podcast. They would do anything to capture attention. I didn't actually listen. Did I do the first one? I may have. I can't even remember now. Good Lord. We reacted to a couple of the podcast um, parts on our Patreon, and it was just the most nonsensical drivel she would not let the guests speak it was all about these weird platitudes and pre-rehearsed stories and it was just nothing to it nothing personable again no charisma no charm nothing so to capture attention during things like the podcast they would disclose things about themselves including their pregnancy reveal um and having little archie come on the mic and saying isn't it fun you know that sort of thing but to quote Piers Morgan, they quit the country for privacy, but they haven't shut up since. During this time, this is where things get really rough. Okay. Megan was handed victory in her court case against uh, the Mail on Sunday. The judge determined she was not subject to cross-examination. It was Judge Warby. And he refused to hear from the palace employees on any of this. He decided that the newspaper's evidence was irrelevant and that the newspaper had breached her privacy. Quote, her letter was a from a distressed daughter and it was private. Even though Megan knew that it would be leaked out and leaked out parts of it herself, you know, oh God. You know, I it just makes me sick. It, I mean, I don't know if you guys followed the whole Johnny Depp thing and that whole miscarriage of justice over in the UK. I just, I, I would say it goes right along with that. It's just, and believe me, America has huge issues. I'm not at all saying we're above shit like that, but oh, it's just frustrating to hear. It's just awful. So after this, um, the press started saying, well, the judge's decision was a dream come true for, for a powerful couple wishing to escape scrutiny. Megan put out a statement saying, we've all won. You can't take someone's privacy and exploit it. Okay, think about that. You can't take someone's privacy and exploit it. What have they done since they left? Think about the book Spare, where they published supposed text messages between like her and Catherine. That's not, isn't that what they're doing? Is exploiting people's privacy for money? That's exactly what they're doing. But yet if it's, you know... According to them, if it's done to them, then that's not okay. As long as they're the ones doing it, they're fine with that. Then she went on to say the public was owed reliable fact-checked news. Well, 
again, I say, what about all the ridiculous statements that have been proven false that these two have put out, including during the court case, having to apologize for lies she told? Like talking about her claiming not to have helped with finding freedom. Then we go over to the Oprah interview. So they're getting ready for the Oprah interview. They had weeks leading up to it where Megan's lines were, quote, written, rewritten, and rehearsed. So she knew when to hesitate. This is all according to Tom Bauer. She knew how to portray reluctance. She knew how to bash the royals but pretend like she wasn't. She had it all down to a science. The interview lasted three hours and 20 minutes. Harry was included after two hours. So it was during this interview they revealed that their baby was a girl. Ugh, just nauseating. Again, Patreon, we reacted to that as well. We're still going through it, but ugh, just so hard to watch. Just so one-sided and, again, disgusting. I mean, it, it really is. Nothing but lies and, you know, defamatory statements about the royal family and the members of it. But, again, you know, they go back to, they're the victims, they're the victims in all this. They can't possibly be the awful ones. They're the victims. So after this, the queen decided Harry and Meghan should resign from their royal patronages and that Harry would lose his military titles. But since he was born a prince, he got to keep that title. Ugh, that's the thing that irks me the most. I love the queen. I'm not second guessing her, but I'm just asking in general, why? Why do they get to keep their titles? I just, oh, I wish that would go away so much. I just don't think that they're earned or deserved, especially after everything they've done. So the palace put out a statement basically saying what was going on. Well, the Sussexes, of course, had to fight back through statements, <clears throat> Megan, um, and their statements went up as fin- Philip was reentering the hospital. Again, no regard for that or what the queen was going through. It's all about themselves. 3rd of March rolls around. And it was during this time that the Times reported allegations of Megan's bullying. So this was the Jason Knopf report that it started to come out in the Times. They talk about these um, unnamed sources and that all these assistants were resigning and some of them were losing self-confidence, couldn't stop shaking, all the stories we've heard. They go into it in this part of the book that they were operating in a climate of fear and that the assistants were routinely humiliated in front of their peers. So again, this is at the hands of both Harold and Fraud. So Harry and Meghan were both doing this to the people that worked with them. Their team that they claimed not to have, right? They had no help. But um, it's just awful. And it, it's, I mean, it just shows how truly awful, I gotta find a new word for awful, how terrible these people are. How terrible Harold and Meghan are. Just terrible people who who just treat people. I just don't understand how you treat people like that. How do you lose? How does it ever become okay to treat people like that? It's not. It's not. But again, these allegations of bullying come out and Meghan's go-to is, no, I was bullied. They, instead of addressing it, they spin it around and say, no, the palace, they're they're saying this it's a malicious attack from the palace but they themselves are the quote innocent victims you guys i cannot with these two so here's where i get frustrated with the palace you know i'm very pro-royal but i don't understand why the palace was so slow to investigate this and it's so frustrating because megan's whole thing is the palace never protected me but when she's accused of something truly heinous like treating people like this, the palace protected her. And I wish like hell they would let those people out of their NDAs. I really do. So they protected Megan. There is a quote here by Tom Bauer that says, those concerned, meaning the people that worked in the palace with them, uh, with Harold, Harry and Megan, or, those concerned are fed up with the hypocrisy of it all, that the Sussexes were being bullied and forced out when others were experiencing that treatment at their hands. So that's exactly what I'm saying. That's the most frustrating part. Can you imagine you've been treated this way? The people that were treating you like this go on to say they're the ones that were bullied and sent out of the UK or whatever bullshit they're peddling this week. 
Megan's lawyers um, had a week's notice of the Time story coming out, and the Sussexes could produce no legal grounds to prevent its publication. Hmm. Almost like it's uh, true or something. So Megan's response was to put out a statement that says, let's call this what it is, a calculated smear campaign based on misleading and harmful misinformation. So again, nothing's ever their fault. Things were only done to them, not the other way around. They blamed Buckingham Palace for giving credibility to the story. She called herself the victim of bullying. You guys, I cannot. I feel like my head is going to explode. Explode. I hate the word gaslighting, but it so fits here. They're gaslighting all of us. We know what happened. And you're saying that, oh, no, you couldn't have done it because you're a bully. Oh, okay, great. That's how that works. Harry and Meghan had convinced themselves that William was responsible for the leak. What about, wouldn't it be Knopf or one of his team members that leaked this most likely? But no, they they convinced themselves it was William. You know what? I don't care if it was William. I kind of hope it was. But <laughs> I don't care who it was. There's a story there, right? It got out. And they're just mad that it got out. But they spin everything to make themselves look like the victim. During this time, the palace had hired a new team of lawyers to investigate the bullying claims. And again, this is where you get frustrated with the palace. Let those people out of their NDAs. Let's talk. I want to know what they have to say. Also, during this time, Megan had her friends release statements on her behalf, saying what a good person she is. You know who released those statements? People from Suits. She doesn't have any actual friends, so she has to go back to the people she worked with on Suits. And they blame things like misogyny and racism and all the other isms that we've talked about, sexism, all that stuff. Let's see. They called the royal family archaic. They were, quote, forced to flee the UK. Not that they burned bridges and ran. It's that they were forced to flee. God, everything is spun as them being the victim. Uh, they talked about the royal family, quote, outliving its relevance. And again, asshole Harry is just... Along for the ride. Yep, that's my family, but uh, you're right. That's that's all true. I'm going to go along with all that. And yet, in the same breath, in the book spare, but I, but I, love, my, I love my brother. <laughs> okay. You have a really weird way of showing it. You seem to show your love the same way Megan does. Imagine that. Uh, Serena Williams, Katy Perry, Orlando Bloom, all neighbors of Harry and Megan. Imagine that. They're all speaking out, too. Huh. Weird, huh? It's almost like they're all in this together. Um, Megan's lawyers didn't go after a defamation claim against the time. Almost like it could be true. <sighs> and that's where I'm ending this because I'm so mad and I'm so frustrated. and I hate these people so much. So I'm ending it here because we only have, I think, an hour left in the audiobook. We'll get through it and finish up these recaps and we'll jump into Cordia's. I gotta think of a fun way to say that. Cordia, something like that. I don't know. Cordia sounds so much more regal. So I think I have to be more regal and talk like Lady C or something. I don't know. I'll have to give it some thought. But guys, uh, let me know in the comments. I know you got to be frustrated too. It's. I think this is what keeps me fascinated by these two. It's just the hypocrisy of all of it. They're deranged, right? I mean, it's like sociopathic shit, right? I mean, <laughs> it's just wild. Without further ado, let's get into, ready? Ready? Revenge! Guys, we're about to get into courtiers. So I think I'll be saying courtiers like that when we get into courtiers. Okay. See, it's addictive, right? Courtiers. Okay. Revenge! So we pick up on chapter 37, Netflix. So this is March of 2021, and we're talking the Friday before the big ol' Oprah interview that airs that Sunday. There's a clip that comes out of Megan's promotion for the, you know, for the interview, and there's a voiceover that says, banned by the palace from giving an interview 2018. Well, Yes and no. I mean, she was about to get married. She wasn't even married yet. And remember, she actually told Oprah, now's not the time. We'll, don't worry, we'll get into it. Basically, like, you know, don't worry, I got a plan for all this. Your part's coming. Don't worry. 
Harry and Plotter knew exactly what they were doing. They wanted to have the last word on the rift with the royal family. They needed to paint themselves as victims for the whole wide world, and this was just the stage to do it, and Oprah was just the one to help them do it. So there were lots of promotions leading up to this thing. I remember it. I remember sitting down that Sunday night and watching it and thinking, oh my god. The whole time I watched it. You guys, we've been going through this interview on Patreon, and it is even worse than I remembered, and I didn't think that that was possible. Let's get into chapter 38, the interview. So the interview with Oprah airs March 7th, 2021. I love me some Tom Bauer, so I have to give him credit here. He points out Megan trying to look, quote, harmless and playing into her victimhood, especially outlining her eyes. <laughs> I don't know what look she was going for, but all I can think of is, oh, this is the bird shit dress. This is the dress that looks like a bird took a dump all over it. That's the look she was going for. Okay. This is where oh, so much, so much infuriating things happen. This is where the racism claims are coming out that they label the British press racist. This is the narrative that they were all pushing, even though Harry will eventually turn around and say, no, we didn't. We didn't do that. The press did that. There are so many them talking over themselves, talking in circles, blatant lies, things that have come out since this interview. It just makes my head spin. I want to do a separate video on that. But uh, just some of the just the at the base level, some of the things that came out, this is where they start to claim that the media created a false narrative, this whole privacy thing. They blame, they say, no, that's, that's a false narrative um, created by the media. But they seem to have forgotten their suit all about privacy against the mail on Sunday. See how nothing they say makes any sense? They even conflicted themselves when discussing Megan's self-harm thoughts. They were conflicting stories within the same interview about how long it happened, when it happened, that sort of thing. Harry's talked about getting seven years of help with like therapy and stuff, and yet he was unable to get his wife any help. We've been through that. It just, they talk about it here. It just, no, they don't talk about it here. And that's why I'm, it makes me crazy. It was just so frustrating because as any of us with half a brain realized, this was not real journalism. These were not real stories. This was not the truth. And when contradicting themselves, they were not questioned on any of it. It was just a paycheck for Oprah, who sold the rights to this. You know, they talk about, uh, Tom Bauer goes into it, the rights made so much money for Oprah and et cetera, and CBS. Um, based on this, so why would Oprah want to poke holes in any of this, right? It's not in her best interest to. So she just threw these softball questions that, according to Bauer, Megan sounds like she probably knew what was going to, of course she knew, knew what was going to be asked and was able to prepare answers and have a script ready to go. They bring up the whole, I've talked about it so much, but the bridesmaid dress thing and who made who cry. Of course, Megan jumps on the opportunity to be a victim and says, no, the reverse happened. Kate made me cry. She owned it. She apologized. I mean, can you imagine? Imagine me and Catherine who's put up with all this crap from Megan and then there's this. Megan gets to go paint herself as a victim. Imagine being one of the staff that having been bullied by Megan and Harry and you have to hear this crap, how they're painting themselves as these victims. Ugh. It is disgusting, right? Absolutely disgusting. But Megan, of course, has to be the victim and says she remains silent to protect Kate. Bullshit. When has she ever remained silent and when has she had any interest in anybody but herself? She claims during this interview that she left the house two times in four months during the last part of her pregnancy with Archie. She seems to have forgotten. No, no, you took two private trips to New York, once for her baby shower and once to watch... Um, Serena play tennis and four different holidays in Europe. But then she said she couldn't meet her friends for lunch. Tom Bauer shows evidence that she had a very much a social life, not only in London, but she would also go to trips to a country house. So, hmm, recollections may vary there, huh? God, you guys. <sighs> I respect the queen so much. Can you imagine? She was dealing with so much, the queen, and then having to deal with these two a-holes. 
So she throws out this thing about three days before our wedding, the Archbishop of Canterbury married us. Well, we know this. That's bullshit. British law doesn't work like that. Megan didn't know this when she said it. She thought that she could get away with it because that's something you can do in America and not realizing, oh, no, 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 that doesn't make any sense. But again, Oprah doesn't question it. Nobody questions. I mean, we question it, but I'm saying Oprah doesn't question it. No journalists question it. They just go along with whatever lies she feels like telling. She gets into the archy skin color of it all. We've heard this a million times, so I'm kind of breezing over it, but it's just so infuriating to hear back. She's absolutely race baiting here, saying that Archie would, quote, not be titled the same way the other grandchildren would be. (sighs) Okay. Meg knew that her argument, well, she knew that she was telling lies. She knew that, that her argument was inaccurate because George V in 1917 dictated that Archie would not become prince until Charles was crowned king. So she can, she knows this. Harry knows this. But yet, nobody facts checks anything. She just says whatever, and Harry just goes along with it, and these two lie about everything, and the journalist that's supposed to be leading the interview is just going right along with it, too. Why do any fact-checking or discrediting when you're all making money off this? The interesting part about the skin color conversation is they even contradict themselves as to when it happened. Megan is describing it as having happened during her pregnancy. When Harry discussed it, he talked about it happening before they were even engaged. So they can't even make up their minds on when any of this supposedly happened. They cannot keep their stories straight for shit. And I get mad, and you can hear my voice because, oh, these two. How anybody can believe anything out of their mouths at this point is so far beyond me. But going back to that title thing, remember... The he's not going to be titled the same way the other grandchildren would be based on his skin color. No, 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 no. I already talked about, you know, that's a thing from 1917. But I'd also like to remind you that she previously announced she didn't want Archie to have a title. They were offered one. She said, no, thank you. Actually, that's too polite. She probably said F no and F you. <laughs> so she she said no. She doesn't want a title. But now that's not what happened. Now it's he wouldn't be given a title. She's race baiting. We all know what she's doing. We can see right through it. And it's disgusting. So her assertion was because her son would be brown. They were changing the convention to everything again. Not what's happening at all. They never did identify who the, quote, they was. And they didn't explain how convention would be abandoned. They just say these things with absolutely nothing to back it up. And people just buy a hook, line, and sinker. But Oprah, again, didn't question anything. So I hold her to the same standard. She's hosting this thing. Probably should have done some homework on this. But it seems to behoove her not to poke holes in this. Because, again, she's making money on all this, too. Oh, goodness. Let's see here. Harry went into how Diana's like Megan. Ugh, that guy has some serious issues. Point you back to spare for that. Tom Bauer goes into how a lot of Americans, <clears throat> I take exception to this, fell for it. But I'm saying, nah, if you're on this page, you probably realize like I did. Nah, she's full of shit. But a lot of the media bought it and decided to accuse the palace of racism. Now, again, I bring you to... Not that long ago, Harry's like, no, no, I never, we never accused them of that. What are you talking about? (sighs) God. All right. Let's take a breath. (sighs) Megan's supporters blindly followed her inaccuracies and contradictions in the interview. Again, I want to make a video on this, so that's on my to-do list. Their lies were almost psychotic. That's what Thomas Markle says. And calls for their titles to be stripped started coming after this interview came out. This is where the statement, Recollections May Vary, came from. I love the Queen so much. They were very, very nice. Uh, The palace was, and I would say the Queen was, in responding to these two after this. And they politely said, Recollections May Vary. We still love Harry and Meghan. That is so much more gracious than anything I come out with. I can think about 32 cuss words I'd like to add into that statement, but the queen's a better person than me. Lapdog Omid Scobie says that, oh, the palace 
didn't take full ownership, so how could they possibly move forward? Of course they're not, you idiot. It's because Harry and Meghan are lying. Harold and Fraud are lying, so of course they're not going to own it. God. Piers Morgan um, was sickened by this two-hour trash-a-thon of the British royal family. He was publicly outspoken and talking about not believing Megan, not believing Megan. Sorry, when I get mad, my Southern comes out. They're not believing Megan. <laughs> There's a division. Some people saw Megan as, well, I guess Harry and Megan as the villains who lied about the royal family, but then others saw them, her especially as, quote, courageous. I don't understand that. I don't understand watching this and the contradictions even if you didn't realize at the time, knowing now all the contradictions that have come out, how do you follow these two? I, that I'll never understand. I'm looking at you, sugars. Make it make sense. Tom Bauer brings up an excellent question about, well, does a self-proclaimed victim have the right to not have truths questioned? Because that seems to be where a lot of society, I wouldn't even say a lot of society, I guess outspoken people on social media seem to lay. If you feel like the victim and you self-proclaim it, then you should not have your truth, truths questioned because then that makes you, I don't know, whatever is you want to apply to that. So then we go into chapter 39, Backlash. I love it. Uh, after the Oprah interview, Charles took on this whole, quote, heal and mend philosophy to try to keep from having an estrangement with Harry and Meghan. William ended up calling Harry right after the interview. Funny enough, somehow Gail King seemed to know all about this private phone call, including the details of it, and even called it, quote, not productive, saying that the call was not productive. So interesting. Somebody who hates the media so much, Harry and Meghan, they sure don't mind leaking parts of whatever benefits them to the media. Hmm. I don't think it was William that called up Gail King. <laughs> Who had such a relationship with her? Oh, yeah, it was Harry and Meghan. So they were convinced that America would love them and they wouldn't need the palace. And uh, you can hear the glee in my voice because knowing how things have worked out since, you know, since all this makes me laugh because they, yeah, they guessed that completely wrong. So CNN was working on a report showing all the inaccuracies in the Oprah interview. And according to Tom Bauer, Maggie Poo found out about it and requested that they pull the story. So they did. I hate the media so much. I, tr I sound like Harry, but I do. I do. They're awful. Uh, it doesn't matter which side you fall on. They're all awful, right? Just disgusting to hear. So during this time, they registered R12 Audio, R12 Productions, all these things in Delaware. Mm -hmm. We've talked about that before. A lot easier to not show certain paperwork when you do that. Just saying. Harry was aligning himself with these companies that preached ethics. Again, I find that very funny. They even go into online ethics and get into, quote, ethical investing. All about ethics from the two that cannot tell one single detail that is not a lie. <laughs> they can't keep a single lie straight, right? They can't, nothing is true with these two, and yet they're going to get into ethics. It was during this time, unfortunately, that Prince Philip passed away. Meghan cited being seven months pregnant as a reason for not traveling. I'm sure the royal family was like, whew. <laughs> there was even a report, according to Bauer, that the Queen told a trusted aide, thank goodness Meghan isn't coming. I hope that's true. I love the Queen, and I love her sense of humor, and I think that's fabulous if she actually said that. William and Harry were remaining separated. They made sure of that. They didn't want them to have it out at this funeral. But there was a time they refer back to when Catherine did a maneuver to try to engineer a conversation between the brothers. Sounds like it didn't go great. Harry had no interest in reconciliation. Sounds familiar, right? That seems to be what Megan was doing with that letter as well. Just let's get it on paper, but let's not actually have any interest in reconciliation whatsoever. All right, so May 14th rolls around. Harry had put out this, and I totally forgot about this. I want to do some more research into this. The Me You Can't See. Did anybody watch this? Apparently it was with Apple TV, they said. And it was like a, I don't know. <sighs> I don't know what you want to call this. It sounds like it was like a um, platitudes and therapy and all. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sounds like another platform for Harry to preach to us too. How about that? 
So apparently on this thing, according to Tom Bauer, and this is, I need to go watch this thing. Apparently, Harry denounced William and Charles. He criticized the Queen. And according to Bauer, said that they're all villains that he blamed for cycles of suffering. He is such a lovely guy, right? Such a nice guy. Very appreciative of everything he's, you know, received. God, he's really the worst. It just... Again, not not remembering that detail, it just tells me again, like, look how patient Charles especially and William have been with Harry through all this, right? Continuing to be nice and invite him to coronation and stuff, even though he's repeatedly jabbed the royal family. It's, it's really wild at this point. It was during this that he continued to blame the family for Meghan feeling those dark thoughts that we talk about. And again, I say, why is it their fault? It's not. I don't believe her. There, I'm saying I don't believe her. But even if I did, why why can't she take responsibility for this in terms of going to get herself help? Or if she can't do it, why can't Harry step up and help her? Having, again, discussed seven years of therapy for himself. Why is it the family's fault? You get what I'm saying? He used things like he said, quote, he was felt bullied into silence. He called it, quote, total neglect. What are we talking about? Okay, so soon after this, Lilibet was born. And apparently, I guess two days or four days, I forget what he said, before she was born, they registered the name, the website, lilibetdiana.com. After Lilibet was born, Harry called the queen to let her know, hey, baby's here, we named it Lilibet. Bauer basically explains this was his way to try to stay in good with the queen, but then it comes up that he was telling the queen rather than asking the queen. Well, BBC reported on this very thing, and what did they do? They threatened to sue. Well, guess what? You can't sue when it's the truth, because they ended up having to back off of that lawsuit. (laughs) Apparently there was some sort of proof, something like that, that they did not call to ask the queen's permission. They told her, Hey, we named it Lilibet. Can you imagine? Again, bashing her, bashing the family, bashing her, and then saying, but guess what? We named our baby after you. See, we're still good. We're still, we're still good, right? (laughs) You're not cutting us off, right? Oh God. I even danced over that at one point. Sorry, going back to the Oprah interview. At one point during the interview, he claims that his father had completely cut him off before they left for California. Well, that's another thing that was found not to be true. Somebody went over Charles's finances and found that he had given over $1 million to the Sussexes since they left for California. I mean, or after they came to California. So again, another thing that, huh, recollections may vary. You fucking liars, right? <laughs> Just another thing that they're lying about. They can't tell the truth on anything ever. It is interesting because they said during this time, it was starting to show that the monarchy's enduring strength was more appealing to people and that William and Catherine were becoming more popular and shining where the Sussexes were falling in popularity. Also during this time, they unveiled that statue of Diana. They invited both brothers to unveil the statue. William was very hesitant to go, but he did end up going. Pretty much everybody else stayed away, it sounds like. Harry's destiny was built on undermining the Windsors, so he tried to do that anywhere he could. He knew that he needed to, uh, he just didn't care about anybody, right? He just cared about making money and spreading whatever the hell he's trying to spread around. Um, July 2021 rolls around. The Mail on Sunday is asking Knopf for a statement. Knopf is forwarding an exchange of emails between him and Harry and Meghan, Basically, what it boils down to is the palace was ready to talk. These bullying claims were still out there, and they were revealing that, oh yeah, Knopf was involved in helping write the letter to her father, and that Scobie was given a copy of the letter to her father for finding freedom, that her friend got a copy of the letter and stuff. You know, again, just undermining all of her. I think everybody's just sick of it. So they're like, no, we're going to tell the truth. Here's the truth. Tom Bauer calls it a challenge to make truthfulness. And I'd say, 
I don't think she's capable of truthfulness. It sounds like nothing they do is truthful at all. All right, guys. So this is chapter 40 through, I think it's 44, which you're like, oh, hey, Jen, you're, no, actually it's 43, I think. It doesn't matter. It's not, it sounds like a lot. It's really not, not too much to talk about, except for we're going to make it some stuff to talk about. It's honestly kind of a bummer at the end because, well, it ends before we know all the bad stuff that happens with Spare. So <laughs> it seems like it's going to be a happy ending, but we know it's not a happy ending. <laughs> but um, we'll get into all that. Okay, guys, I'm breaking the fourth wall again because I just looked up to see the pictures. What is this outfit, you guys? What are these outfits? Seriously, that is awful. This is the same trip, by the way, this dress. So you can tell it's hot. She finally gave in and put on a short dress for one of the engagements, but the rest she dressed like this. Oh my goodness. Seriously, what is happening? So much money spent on these clothes too. Oh, I have a picture up. You'll see it where it has the price of all the clothes. And bear in mind that red outfit that I think they said was like 12,000 pounds. That one is, um, she wore to a, a school, I believe in Harlem, something like that. Yeah, where they ended up giving money to the school. It's uh, they the school needed some help, so she she wore a really expensive suit. That's nice, huh? Very thoughtful. Okay, <laughs> this is her reading the bench at the school. We'll get into that. Okay, so like I say, this is the end of the book. We get into she wrote this thirty-four page kids book, the bench. Um, apparently it was panned online. I went to find reviews, and it looks like her supporters have <laughs> pumped up the rating a little bit. But it's a book on fatherhood. It's on the warmth, the joy, the comfort that fathers can bestow on their children. And again, ironic since they're basically estranged from both dads. I know Charles is not estranged, but I'm saying she tore. Well, you know what? I'm not even going to just blame her. I'm going to say they tore themselves away from Charles on that one. But she definitely was estranged from her dad. Uh, Tom Bauer's a petty bitch like I am, and he likes to point out that her book release ranked 4,934th on the British Amazon chart two weeks after its release. The Daily Telegraph called it her semi-literate book that leaves Harry holding the baby. <laughs> so it was around September 2021 that this was all going on. They ended up going to New York for a three-day tour. They took a private jet, and... They were doing all sorts of media. They had restricted the media to just photographs. They had their own film crew there, it sounds like. They stayed at the Carlisle, which was Diana's favorite hotel. They were basically hobnobbing with the political powers that be at the time. I, I don't get into politics, so I'm not even going there. But it, it just sounded like a disaster. And I remember this tour. People were commenting on what is happening with her <laughs> again, it's 80 degrees. Look at this outfit. You know, like they're talking about, basically they called her Michelle Obama cosplay. And, and that made me laugh. I don't know what she was dressing for. I don't understand what I'm looking at. I don't understand any of this. It takes a lot of money to look that stupid. That's all I'll say. So according to Tom Bauer, he actually said that outfit she wore to the Harlem school to read the bench was 15,000. Maybe that's in dollars. I don't know. It's around $15,000. How about that? Nice, huh? So then we go into chapter 41, Victory. And unfortunately, it's not great. And I don't mean Tom Bauer. I mean, what happens? The Mail on Sunday was trying to appeal. Remember, they had lost. It's so frustrating, you guys. So frustrating. Okay. Remember, Megan had had a, quote, unfortunate lapse in memory where she forgot all this important information. Basically, you know lied to the judge, but no, she forgot, you guys. She'd forgotten emails exchanged with Mr. Knopf, and she forgot meeting with the authors of Finding Freedom. So when doing the appeals, the judges saw this and decided, well, yeah, sure, that's a thing, and they marked it as a, quote, unfortunate lapse in memory and would not allow the mail on Sunday to appeal. Isn't that some crap right there? It's just, it really is. It's awful. Um, Megan then deemed herself successful and s accused the tabloids of profit from lies and pain they create. If you, I mean, p 
pot calling the kettle, right? Because isn't that what spare is all about? The lies and pain they create and how can they profit off of it? That seems to be their whole shtick. So I don't know what she's talking about. <sighs> Megan appeared on Ellen at this time. Oh, by the way, Ellen, we, it's probably up by now because we've been working on it. I'm, tr we're, we're reacting to that stupid appearance on Patreon. Um, th remember when she went on Ellen and she was, what was she doing? Barking and squatting and drinking out of a milk bottle. Oh, so cringe. Oh, can't wait to talk about it. Anyway, so yeah, so she was doing anything for media attention, basically. All right, so I know I'm going fast, but there really wasn't much more to that chapter. We get into chapter 42. Revenge. Yep, that's the name of the chapter. Harry was refusing to seek any reconciliation whatsoever. So this is, I don't know, around 2022. It was early 2022, March. He had not wanted to make up at Prince Philip's funeral. He didn't uh, want to make up at the Diana, you know, the statue reveal that I talked about last time. He just was not having it whatsoever. He was trying to find a reason to skip the Platinum Jubilee as the you know Queen's Platinum Jubilee. And he was looking for a reason to skip it because it was going to showcase that they were private citizens and they would not be on the balcony or in any carriages. Well, he and Maggie Poo can't have that. They need to mention it at all times. Well, this was also when they were working on filming Netflix. So this was just not working out. Um... They needed that shot. They really wanted to get the shot on the balcony and it just wasn't working out for them. He decided to take on this whole, again, victim thing. He was trying to force the government to provide police protection for them. And the government said, no, 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 <laughs> you're private citizens. We can't do that. That's no. Um, and yet he still, he seemed to act afraid to go back to England, but he seemed fine because he was scheduled to go to the Invictus Games in April in Holland, and he had no mention of worrying about private police protection there. Oh, goodness. So they go into Harry's dislike of Camilla and how it's being re-energized by Megan. We sure know this in the book Spare, because he, he took aim at her in that one. Early 2021 rolls around, and I mean, again, Cortez, you guys can fill me in, because it was a little confusing but the way I understood it is Charles had gotten in trouble years ago. I think it was, I think they'd said maybe 2017, something like that. He had done some business with this Saudi businessman and it came out in 2021 that he was, basically they were accusing him of doing cash for honors. I'm not here to bash Charles. I don't fully understand the story. The, the only reason I bring this up is because Harry decided to pounce on this, spoke about it, and highlighted his concern for his father's conduct. The ego on these two, seriously, to think they have any leg to stand on regarding anybody else's conduct. At least Charles isn't trying to take down his family. They, The way Bauer explained it is it was like um, he was raising money for charity and yeah, it got a little shady. <laughs> But Harry pounced on this. Harry would pounce on this. He's the worst. The, he, Tom Power goes into this whole thing where Harold and Fraud during this time went to the NAACP Awards. And they took Doria with them. And they were given an award. But then he was quick to point out that part of the deal negotiated was that they get this award. And coincidentally, totally coincidental, you guys. At the same ceremony, it was announced that Archwell was sponsoring a new... <laughs> you can't even make this stuff up. I can't even get through it without laughing. Archwell was also sponsoring a new award. Hmm. Looky there. And he's speaking out on Charles's transactional arrangements. And looky there. All right. Archwell accounts were shrouded in mystery, but the purpose seemed to be clear that it was to publicize the Sussexes, and they were going to use it any way they could to try to get ahead. All right. Chapter 43, Fallout, March 2022. Again, this is this kind of gets murky. All right. William and Catherine were on an eight-day tour of the Caribbean. And it sounds like they were going to Belize, Jamaica, 
sorry, <laughs> almost said Jamaican, Belize, Jamaica, and the Bahamas. Unfortunately, they seem to be Team Megan, and they bought into Megan's message of racism. They actually believed when she said about her child being denied a title because of, you know, the color of his skin, like she had said on Oprah. So it did not go well for William and Catherine. It just stinks. The whole thing stinks. And I hate that he, I think he was going into this to point the fallout that's happening because of the words of these two, that they're doing things like this. They're just speaking and not thinking. Well, they are, they're thinking about themselves. They don't care about anybody else and it's affecting everybody. And again, all it makes me do is realize, oh my gosh, the Queen, Charles, um, William and Catherine, they have all been so much nicer to Harold than he ever deserved, right? He He didn't deserve even an ounce of their, what's the word I'm looking for? Patience right? I mean, he, he's truly the worst. Okay. So Jubilee was rolling around. Harry and Megan would be confined to these VIP enclosures and not on the balcony. Well, this wouldn't do because they were supposed to get footage for Netflix. (laughs) So Harry started making a fuss, started calling up people being Harry about it, right? He ended up badgering the queen's advisors, well, they were hesitant. They're like, uh, you know, no, you can't, you can't be up on the balcony. Well, when he failed to get what he asked for, he asked for a meeting with the queen. And this part made me absolutely sick. According to Tom Bauer, Harry spun it as he wanted to extend an olive branch to clear the air, to make things better for the queen, right? So she agreed. They go to London, right? They stay with Eugenie, Harold and Fraud. They walk through this park on the way to meet with the queen. Turns out they were doing that to get filmed by Netflix. So the queen's insistence, on the queen's insistence, they had to meet with Charles and Camilla first, and then they would go on to meet with the queen. Well, the Sussexes, with no respect, no regard for anybody else but themselves, what do they do? They arrive late. They, Bauer didn't, go too deep in the meeting, but he just said that things were not resolved, basically. Then they went on to have tea with the queen, and still, theirs was not resolved in terms of all they wanted to do was get on that balcony to get that Netflix shot. But they, everybody realized at this point, we can't trust these two. Of course, we don't want them up there. They left all pissy, and they ended up going to the Netherlands again for the Invictus Games. The Netflix cameras were, of course, in tow, following behind for footage. Harry decided this would be a good place to go ahead and vent his anger. He ended up venting to an NBC reporter because he wasn't getting his way. He wasn't on this balcony, right? So, again, he pretended to the queen it was an olive branch. But as soon as he doesn't get his way, he's venting to an NBC reporter. Remember, he hates the press guys, but he sure doesn't mind talking crap about his family to him. So, he brags to this reporter about his special relationship with the queen that she would confide in him. So it's like a jab in the eye. Like she can't trust anybody else. She only trusts me. So she confines in me. To me, I took the, and Tom Bowden says, I took it as, is he saying, is he threatening? Is he like, I know stuff on the queen. What's he doing? He started to say that the queen had the wrong people around her. So again, this is what really bugs me is he's putting down, he's essentially putting down the queen and saying, basically, she doesn't know what's going on. She's got the wrong people around her. (sighs) So Harry basically resumed war on his family. Uh, Tom Bauer, I love this, called it breathtaking arrogance. That's exactly how I would describe it. Everybody else is wrong, but these two are always right, right? (laughs) The people advising the queen are wrong. These two know everything. He, I, I just the breathtaking arrogance. I don't know how to explain it. That's exactly what it is. So during this meltdown, I guess, with the NBC reporter, he decides, oh, crap, I'm coming across bad. I better lean into the Diana stuff. So he starts talking about, he starts speaking warmly of Diana. During this conversation, he also said that America was his home. But he forgot, literally, I think they said two weeks before, a few weeks before, 
he contradicted his, himself when he had gone to high court to try to petition for the protection. Remember, I just talked about that. He said that Britain is and always will be his home. So, you know, again, he'll say anything, both of them will, to get whatever they want. They don't care. They don't care what, <laughs> they don't care who they're hurting, obviously. They don't care what lies they tell. They'll say anything. So the Sussexes obviously couldn't be trusted. Again, that's from Tom Bauer. What else is new? We know this already. Four years they had been together, and this is the destruction, right? They've tarnished the royals. They He actually, Tom Bauer calls them agents of destruction, and I love that so much. I think that's perfection. So May the 6th rolls around, and the queen announces Meghan, Harry, and Andrew would all be banned from the balcony and her jubilee celebration in June. The news media was warned one hour before the announcement went out, while Omid Scobie, lapdog, had to jump in, say that the Sussexes were very appreciative. What were they doing while well, they were trying to spin it? Basically, their status and their Netflix agreement required them to stay in okay with the family so that way they could get at least into London. You know? Acknowledgement basically of the downgrade. I'm sure privately they were fuming, but they um, they let go of the special status and the loss of the protection and all that. And again, had Scobie report that they were going and they were excited and honored. Again, turning it like they're the special guests at the Jubilee. Everything has to be about them. Thomas Markle had planned to go to the Jubilee. He had made this announcement that he wanted to be there. And I, Tom Bauer says he wanted to disrupt Megan's plan to go there and get filmed with the qu queen and the kids. And I kind of love that if that's the case. But uh, unfortunately, Thomas Markle ended up having a stroke during this time and lost the ability to speak for a little while and had to cancel that trip to London. So, <sighs> Megan, I'm sure she somehow had a role in something, all I'm saying. So instead of going to see her dad, what did Megan do? She went and did that awful, I can't even talk about this because it makes me feel so disgusted. That awful photo shoot, Uvalde, that, you know what I'm talking about, with the children. Um, a terrible event happened here in America, and a bunch of kids were taken out. And so Megan brought a film crew to go, I don't know, put on a show in front of it. And it was just disgusting. I don't, I, ugh, I don't even want to talk about it. She's a terrible person. But again... Um, Bauer points out it could have been, I think, a two or three hour car ride to see her dad, but instead she felt like she needed to go do this um, promotional shoot for herself uh, and, and use these kids in this way. It's really gross. All right. So Bauer basically recaps it and says meeting Harry had delivered the fame and fortune that Megan had sought that she was a merciless opportunist. I love that. I put that in quotation marks. She's a merciless opportunist. That consequences are irrelevant. And she only considers the consequences for herself. I actually even doubt that at some point. And she sought revenge when there was refusal to meet her demands. I would say that applies to both of them. Because we just saw Harry do it with his family, right? So yeah, they sought revenge when there was refusal to meet their demands. So after the Oprah interview and through this time frame, there was Bauer talks about that they had short term popularity, but it sounds like, I mean, we know how this ends, but during the time of the book, he said midterm, we don't know how this is going to go. Well, I can tell you it's not going well. Think about their, uh, what was it? Their popularity ratings and how much people truly dislike them. And didn't they get voted like the least liked quote celebrities and all this stuff? I think that's really funny. The only guaranteed income they have is trading off the family that they've betrayed. And Bauer goes into why he thinks Megan will get into a political career. Uh, I wonder if that's changed, though, because, again, I feel like she's so disliked now. I just can't imagine. I don't know. I just don't. I don't know how she could possibly do that. The Cambridges made sure that during the Jubilee, they didn't have contact with I almost said the Markles. That's basically what it is. The Sussexes. They were, the Sussexes were sat over to the side. 
This is where she wore that stupid white hat and that whole, that look. But I kind of love that he's wrapping it up here because look at how annoyed Harry clearly looks and look how smug she looks. It perfectly, <laughs> perfectly describes them. He seems very painfully stupid and mad at the world and she is just smug. Nothing is ever her fault. She is always the victim and she's smug about it. And so that perfectly is summed up in this picture. But I love that the <laughs> Cambridges and the children and Charles and Camilla and the Queen were all on the balcony for this and no Harold and Fraud. They ended up taking a private jet before the celebration was over because these two are pouty babies and didn't get their way. So the heartbreaking part of this book, it ends with Tom Power explaining that all the Queen wanted was her family to be getting along and happy as she knew it was the end of her life. And the quote from the book is, Harry and Meghan wanted to deny Britain's much-loved, longest-surviving monarch her final happiness. Oh, I don't know. If you, if you didn't hate them before, how do you not hate them after that? Oh, just awful, right? Just awful. And, and even, I mean, no disrespect to the queen. I love the queen. Take the monarch out of it. This is your grandmother. And this is how you're treating a 90-something-year-old lady who knows that she's at the end of her, you know, amazing life. And, and this is what you're doing. This is how you're ending it for her. It's just further proof that they don't care about anybody but themselves. The only thing that is getting me through this depressing part is knowing how things have turned out now and how unlikable and how, I'd say, a lot of people, most people have caught on to their awful antics. And so... It'll be interesting going forward. I'll say that. See what uh, see what happens with these two. But yeah, that's it for revenge. I gotta give it to Tom Bauer. He is quite the writer. I love this book. I love covering it with you guys. Your comments have been amazing. I just appreciate all the love and support. It truly means the whole wide world to me. It really does. I can't wait to jump into more books. <laughs> 